How can you ever hope to capture the enormous complexity of a life in words alone? To adequately convey the nuances, the good times and the bad, and ultimately the little things that make you smile or cry when you look back on the time that you spent, and then wish that you'd been able to hold on to for just a little while longer. How do you choose what you remember? How might it differ from the memories that others take with them? And could it ever be enough just to say that they were loved? This video is going to be stupidly long, so let me just go ahead and say I really love Red vs. Blue. It's actually one of my favorite series of all time, despite being a kind of convoluted machinima made by a group of men who wound up being, let's just say, not the most exemplary of human beings. I don't actually have any real nostalgia for this show like most fans do. The series is older than YouTube, celebrating its 20th birthday today. And, as far as I can tell, most of the folks who enjoyed the series watched it as teenagers in those early days, between matches and Halo CE. And, from that group, even more baffled when they learn that Rooster Teeth has actually yet to stop making the show. I found Red vs. Blue when I was 18, stuck in a depressive state and looking for something that could fill the silence of being home alone while waiting for a response to any of the dozen job applications that I'd sent out. I couldn't tell you why I was drawn to this colorful puppet show, but I wound up binging all 13 seasons that were available on Netflix, and then I spent the next week listening to Contact Redux on repeat despite the fact that it made me super emotional every single time. Flash forward six years later, I'm not ashamed to admit that I'm still pretty obsessed with Red vs. Blue. It's my go-to comfort show, and I actually think that it's one of the most well-written shows that I've ever watched. In large part, that's because of the characters, the arcs that many of them go through, and the way that the show takes seemingly insignificant elements and reinvents them as plot devices that drastically alter the way that you engage with the story. It's a series that rewards you endlessly for rewatching it, and I've watched the first 13 seasons at least six times now. Like I said, it's a comfort show, and ever since spring of 2020, well, let's just say I've needed a coping mechanism. Having spent so much time in this universe has left me with <laughs> a very strong desire to talk about it. So now I want to try and explain just why I've gravitated to this story about a group of assholes standing around in box canyons who wind up having to save themselves and the world way more often than any of them ever wanted to. Red vs. Blue is a web series produced by Rooster Teeth, using the Halo game engine for an animation style known as Machinima. Machinima had been a technique used by early internet creators for years before, but creative lead Bernie Burns didn't realize this at the time. The series was initially intended to only go for about 8 episodes before it almost immediately blew up in popularity. With the sudden growth, Burns saw the opportunity to expand on what material he had already written for the series, and in so doing, transformed another early internet web series into an absolute juggernaut of a brand, with sponsorships from 343 and references to the show hidden within the Halo games themselves. What started as a small project by five guys in a spare bedroom propelled Rooster Teeth into internet fame, with a company that was recently bought by Warner Brothers, has four divisions, and pre-pandemic had approximately 400 employees. These earlier seasons... <laughs> well, they didn't exactly age well in the humor department. There's a lot of early aughts gamer culture embedded within the characters, which means sexism and ableism, and a dash of queer phobia thrown into the mix as well. For me, it doesn't ruin the overall experience of watching the show, and I'm not too proud to admit that I do still laugh at some of these non-jokes. And, like, I know folks who think that Friends is the pinnacle of television, so we all have our media vices. The show is a relic of its time, and I'm able to let that go in order to enjoy the characters and the story behind them. The worst of the jokes get pretty toned down once there's an actual plot to deal with, and eventually they're left behind entirely. I won't play any of the coarser jokes here because I do have some respect for myself as a queer disabled person, but know that if you choose to watch this series, that's something to anticipate. I also need to go ahead and condemn Rooster Teeth's leadership and business practices for fostering a hostile work environment for the company's trans and non-white employees. 
I've spoken in previous projects that I firmly believe that being able to critique the things that you love allows for a deeper appreciation of art, and that goes for the creators as well. In this very particular case, I do feel that it can be appropriate to distance the art from the artist. That's mostly because a lot of the more problematic members of the RVB team have either left the company at this point, or they've shown a self-awareness, and they're working towards taking action to grow from their previous failings. Even with everything that's happened at the company, I do still recommend watching this show, but if you'd rather listen to me recap 13 seasons worth of content, that's valid as well. As is obvious by the runtime on this damn thing. I clearly have a lot of love for this show, and I want to share that, but you don't have to give Rooster Teeth your money if you decide to watch it for yourself. It's all here for free on YouTube, and you can even use an ad blocker to keep them from getting AdSense from your views. There are still a lot of good people working at the company who deserve support, but I can't in good conscience advocate financially supporting Rooster Teeth until they've shown that they're truly making serious attempts at creating an environment that's safe and inclusive for their employees. So with all of that having been said, I think it's time to jump into Blood Gulch. Fair warning, <laughs> this show starts out a bit convoluted. The first major story arc of the series, The Blood Gulch Chronicles, provides a basic understanding of our characters and the setting that they're living in. There are two sides of an ambiguous conflict, the Reds versus the Blues, and each has a base in a box canyon in the middle of nowhere on a planet at the edges of inhabited space. Despite the runtime for these earlier episodes ranging between 2 and 5 minutes long, the writing does an excellent job of efficiently establishing the characters that we'll be following for the foreseeable future and their relationships with each other. Great mysteries, isn't it? Why are we here? I mean, are we the product of some cosmic coincidence, or is there really a god watching everything? Introducing the series on the red team are Griff and Simmons, two soldiers who are opposites of each other while still managing to maintain a fairly amicable relationship. Griff is the team slacker who prefers to navel gaze, while Simmons is the kiss-ass subordinate who's unfortunately for him the smartest person in the canyon. Their leader is Sarge, the pinnacle of military incompetence, and the last member of their team is Donut, the accidentally flamboyant and often naive comic relief. For the Blues, we start with Church and Tucker. Church is the de facto leader with a stick up his ass, and Tucker is a wannabe ladies man with little love for the station that he's been placed in. Rounding out the rest of the team is Caboose, a fan favorite character who starts out simply naive before misfortunes cause him to develop a social ineptitude that bounces off of the rest of the cast. This first season sees the colorful cast of characters going through what seems to be any other day in the canyon, standing around and talking because there's nothing else for them to do. Due to a prior casualty on the blue team, Commanda sent them Caboose and a tank named Sheila, who is technically the fourth member of the team. In order to not have to deal with Caboose, Church orders him to go stand guard at the base's flag and wait for a general to come to do an inspection. As it so happens, at the same time, the Reds are screwing around with Donut and they tell him to go to the store for elbow grease and headlight fluid. Because there is no store, Donut finds Caboose, and Caboose thinks that Donut is the general, so he gives him the flag when he's asked for it. With their flag now effectively captured, this causes a threat escalation between the two sides, and in the chaos, Caboose accidentally shoots Church with her tank. Church's death isn't an end to his character, and he returns as a ghost. Though he's transparent, the fact that Church is dead doesn't actually do much to hinder his presence in the canyon. But because of his death, Tucker radios command for help. For this, the team is given Texas, a freelancer agent with mechanical skills and a ruthless attitude. She's also Church's ex-girlfriend. Church urges his team not to let her get involved, but they do so anyways. But now that Tex is here, Church has decided that he has a new mission, separate her from O'Malley, the aggressive AI that's been implanted in her armor in order to do what he believes is saving her from something that's been manipulating her actions. Tex winds up captured by the Reds, and then after a series of possessions, she's rescued by Church. Tex is ultimately killed off at the end of this season, when she goes to attack Red Base in the tank, and Donut of all characters lands a well-thrown grenade into the driver's seat. Man, that girl's got a really good arm. Oh, crap! While comparatively not much happens in the second season for plot furthering, it brings us the arrival of medical officer Dufresne, aka Doc. He's a pacifist combat medic who's arrived in Blood Gulch in response to the injury of Tex, who has been dead for about three months by this point. All the while, with only Tucker realizing that something is up, Caboose has been in possession of O'Malley. However, the AI is incapable of doing much other than making empty threats. Church has also taken over the body of the Red Team's robot, Lopez, and the first half of the season's plot for the Blue Team revolves around getting the body to function, since Lopez was built by Sarge, and his voice settings are set to Spanish. On the opposite side of the canyon, the Reds are still attempting to come up with a plan to eliminate their enemy. 
It's going about as well as one might expect with incompetent leadership at the helm. And aside from Sarge, no one is especially interested in the goal that they've been given of trying to kill each other. A ceasefire turns into a salt froze for Griff and an exchange of Doc to the Reds. Unfortunately for Doc, as much as he hates violence and refuses to participate it, he often winds up inadvertently causing harm to the people around him, to the point where the Reds try to give him back. It doesn't work. For the latter half of the season, it's revealed that Texas has also returned as a ghost, the same as Church, and when the opportunity arrives, she takes the robot body for herself. With O'Malley gone, she's just as much of a hard ass, but now she recognizes that she needs to find the AI and prevent him from causing further trouble, which means possessing Caboose so that they can kill it while it's trapped inside of his head. While this is going on, the Reds are busy <laughs> turning Simmons into a cyborg and replacing the pieces of Griff that were damaged when he was shot by Sheila with transplants from Simmons. This has basically no consequences for the rest of the series, and Simmons being a cyborg is only ever brought up for a couple punchlines, but I figured it was something worth sharing anyways. The Blues' attempts to isolate O'Malley don't go so well. He escapes from Caboose and finds his way into Doc, turning an accidentally dangerous man into an actively dangerous man. The events that took place inside of Caboose's head have left him with what seems to be, um, a bit of brain damage. He's mostly okay though, and he makes friends with Donut when he's taken hostage during a botched attempt at reconnaissance. In an effort to get new bodies for Church and Tex, they negotiate another exchange, this time Donut for two robots. Sarge decides that this is the perfect opportunity to take out the Blues, so he hides a nuclear weapon inside one of the robots. This starts to devolve thanks to Sheila and Lopez unionizing, command mixing up who they're talking to, and then O'Malley rushing in on an alien vehicle, guns blazing, and taking Lopez hostage. It's at this point that it becomes blatantly obvious that the sides of the war that they're on are fake and don't actually matter. When O'Malley shoots Tucker and kidnaps Lopez through a teleporter gate, the teams recognize the need for an alliance in order to acquire their respective targets. After a bit of bickering, Simmons reprograms the teleporter to take them directly to O'Malley's location, and the team leaves behind Donut and Tex as collateral. And then things get weird. Let's see if I can do this succinctly. With Lopez in tow, O'Malley sabotages the teleporters. When the Reds and Blues go in after him, they wind up scattered across a few different locations. Caboose and Sarge encounter a strange religious cult spoofing Halo CE's capture the flag mode. Griff and Church wind up captured in jail on Sidewinder, the outpost where Church and Tex last saw each other before the series began. And Simmons is in a storage facility with even more teleportation gates. He manages to get everyone back together, meanwhile O'Malley has hired an ex-freelancer agent, Wyoming, to kill Tucker, who is left behind due to O'Malley shooting him because he knows too much about the ruse that is the Red and Blue Armies. Texas makes a deal with Tucker to protect him from her former colleague, and we learn from her that each of the freelancers was named after the 50 American states. 49. Remember? Oh, yeah. That's right. Man. Poor Florida. <sighs> As the team reconvenes, Caboose accidentally activates the timer on the bomb that was built into Church's robot body. Tex gets the jump on Wyoming and knows that O'Malley hired him. We learn here that O'Malley's real name is Omega and that Texas is Allison. Unfortunately, O'Malley is a step ahead of her thanks to having had access to her thoughts for the last few years. Now that the cast is all reconvened on Sidewinder, O'Malley has acquired access to <laughs> a weather controlling device that Sarge never finished building. A brief fight ensues before Simmons uses the teleporters to bring the religious zealots onto their map, where they brutally take down O'Malley. O'Malley's weather device zaps Church with lightning, presumably because he's made of metal, and it shorts out the bomb's trigger mechanism so that it can't be deactivated. Sidewinder was located on a halo ring, orbiting a planet below. When the bomb goes off, thanks to Wyoming being in possession of a time distortion unit, the reds and blues are all able to fall to the planet's surface relatively unharmed. Unfortunately, because they're all idiots, they believe that they've gone forward in time, which... Destroyed the present? Then where are we? We're in the future, numbnuts. Aren't we in the present right now? Aren't we always in the present? Unbelievable. He can't cope with the loss. He's in denial. That is so sad. Son, you're just not listening. The present has been destroyed. It no longer exists. We are in the future. Oh, that makes no sense. The practical reason for this we've gone into the future through line is due to the fact that this is the point at which Rooster Teeth switched from using the Halo CE engine for their mission animating and began using Halo 2, which has a pretty drastic upgrade in graphical quality. 
As the series progresses, the team periodically switches to the latest released games, and while they make light jokes about their upgraded armor, this is the only time that the game jumps are brought up in the series like this. With O'Malley still scheming and in possession of what remains of Lopez, the team continues their pursuit. He's holed himself up in an abandoned power plant, and Texas wants their help in destroying it with O'Malley inside. Because the Reds still want their robot and whatever intel Sarge has stored inside of him, Tex agrees that she'll help them get Lopez back in exchange for a future favor. Despite their numerous incompetencies, they do manage to infiltrate the facility, and Tucker falls into a hole and finds an alien energy sword. Finally, we catch up to Church. As a visual gag for him having been thrown into the past, he's rendered in Bungie's earlier game franchise Marathon. He's interacting with an AI named Gary, who tells him of a prophecy and a great destroyer. Gary is also capable of manipulating time, and Church spends the bulk of the latter half of this season attempting to course correct the events that led to his exploding. Unfortunately, Church winds up at the center of a series of paradoxes in which he is responsible for the accidental murder of his former CEO, Captain Flowers, Donut capturing the blue team's flag, renaming Sheila, formerly Phyllis, and ultimately his own death after having messed with her friendly fire protocol. Farewell, my body. I shake loose these earthy bonds for a better existence. Man, first I kill myself, then I realize I'm a honk and dork. Not a very good day to be me. After a few dozen iterations that only ever ensure that things wind up exactly as they were, Church finally resolves to just winging it and accepting his fate. This final Church frees Tex after Wyoming took her hostage, blows up, and returns to the rest of the cast. He gets Gary to remotely disarm the bomb, and regroups with Tex and Caboose. I didn't want to mess with the timeline! Time... line? Time isn't made out of lines. It is made out of circles. That is why clocks are round. When we see the Reds again, they're debating what to do about a distress signal that they've picked up with their Jeep's radio. When Griff goes to find out what the Blues are up to, it turns out the bomb that they were going to blow the facility up with is named Andy, and he is a massive asshole. Like, more so than any of the other characters in this show. There's a self-awareness about it, but none of the other characters like him, and it's kind of jarring that he's even here. There's something more fun about the other characters' respective assholery. Even with all of the ways that they're offensive, there's a mutuality to it that never really feels like punching down, and is more like punching sideways, which... I mean, it's still just a punch, but the point is, it's more fun to laugh at people who are being jerks to each other in superficial ways when there's not really any danger in being made fun of. One of my personal ways of connecting with my friends over our stressors is by poking fun at mistakes or joking about misfortunes. Because taking everything too seriously means that everything matters. And if everything matters, then that's just that much more to be anxious about. The main cast giving each other grief and empty threats is a personal reminder that even when things are intense, that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't space to cut loose and let yourself stop caring. There is, of course, a danger in falling all the way into apathy, and if you go too far with people who aren't in on the joke, you enter the realm of toxicity. But for me, finding that balance is a lot healthier than letting everything be too serious. Ultimately, the Reds decide to leave, and they track down the signal, leaving Donut behind as O'Malley is orchestrating an attack on the side of the facility that the Blues have holed themselves up in. Donut finds O'Malley's vehicle and uses it to catch up with his team. Tex knocks out Tucker to steal his sword, ostensibly to use it against the army of robots, but honestly, it's because she just really wants it. When Tucker comes to, the bots have been decimated, but it wasn't Tex who did it. Oh, come on, Gary, 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 stop, 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 stop. Hey, if Tex is not the destroyer from the prophecy, then who is? Gary? Who's there? And when the Reds finally reach the source of the distress signal... No! Season 4 opens with a return to Blood Gulch, and finally we see the personalities for these characters that will define their growth for the foreseeable future. It's at this point on as well that the writing levels up, putting our colorful cast into situations and forcing them to have to figure out a way forward while causing conflicts themselves. It's not so much red versus blue anymore as it is shenanigans versus shenanigans. And here we can see the strength of using machinima as an animation medium because as a result of the limitations in physical character actions, the writing is forced to be sharp in order to compensate. While the Reds return to their old home to investigate, and then start to gaslight the hell out of Simmons, the Blues are occupied with trying to make contact with the alien that scared Church so badly that he had to leave his body behind. Trying to get it back doesn't go according to plan, and Tex winds up losing her body as well. Assuming Caboose to be the team's expendable teammate, they send him in to deal with the alien. And because this is Caboose, he makes friends with it and allows Church and Tex to recover their bodies. There is still a language barrier, however. What is your name? 
Your name. Name. Just keep repeating it, Church. I'm sure he'll come up with the right definition on his own. While they're being idiots at the power station, the Reds are busy trying to determine who will replace Simmons now that they've deemed him too delusional to be Sarge's second-in-command. After hosting a brief pageant, Donut is declared Sarge's new favorite, and Sheila invites Simmons to live with her at Blue Base. Now torn apart by the loss of his identity as a member of the Red Army, Simmons paints his armor blue and launches an attack on his former comrades. Meanwhile, the Blues are still trying to communicate with the alien. Tex makes a deal with Andy that she won't use her remote detonator on him if he can act as an interpreter thanks to the translator that was part of the robot kit that she made him from. The Blues learn from the alien that Tucker's sword is part of an alien prophecy and that only the person who passes the trial will be able to wield it. Trial? Please, I fell in a hole. That's not a trial. I'm starting to like this culture though. Any dude who trips is a hero. I'm pretty sure that makes Caboose God. In order to keep the alien from turning on them and killing them all, Tucker, as the sword bearer, will have to join the alien on his quest to defeat some monsters, and he takes Caboose with him. Church tries and fails to say something inspiring or sentimental, and then Tex leaves to join them after Church points out that quests usually have rewards at the end of them. With the rest of his team off on their adventure, Church finds his way back to Blood Gulch and to his old base, where he finds that Simmons has just kidnapped Griff, and Sarge and Donut are making a piss poor attempt at a rescue. Sarge knocks out Griff, mostly because he wants to and with the excuse that it's to prep him for extraction. Church gets the jump on Sarge and knocks him out. Having already recognized Simmons and whatever weird roleplay that the Reds are doing, Church treats him like a new recruit to the Blue Army. Simmons believes that he's successfully infiltrated the enemy, but Donut doesn't recognize him with a differently colored armor. They gather up Sarge and Griff and put them in the Reds' jeep, then take Donut back to his base and tell him to pretend that he rescued his team. Eventually, Simmons defects back to the Reds and attempts to regain Sarge's respect with what little he's learned of the Blues, mainly that Church has made contact with Command. The sword quest doesn't go according to plan. The beast from the prophecy that Tucker was supposed to kill is already long dead by the time that they get there. When they stop to make camp in a swamp, the alien uses Tucker as bait to draw out what it suspected was following them, which turned out to be Tex. She joins them as they make their way to the last stop on the quest, an alien temple that's guarded by a small horde of zealots. Tex sneaks in and begins to take them out, stealthily. Ow! What the fuck? That hurt! Ow! Or maybe not. Until Tucker alerts them. Tex takes them on with ease, and Tucker learns that his sword is actually a key to unlock the temple, which provides their alien friend with a vehicle. Until he gets shot down by Wyoming. Texas goes after him, and the boys return to Blood Gulch. But it's not long before Tucker is suddenly struck with some kind of illness. Because Church doesn't want whatever contagion that he's picked up to spread to the rest of the team, as in Caboose because Church is a robot who's forgotten that he's a robot, they wind up calling Doc. O'Malley is still holding his body hostage with Lopez, seeming to have given up on world domination and settled for this tower in the middle of nowhere. When O'Malley finally shows up, the Reds make their move to retrieve Lopez's head. Unfortunately, Lopez still only speaks Spanish and no one on the team has made any attempt to learn aside from Donut, who has a high school freshman's grasp of the language. So they can't actually understand the message that they've received from command unless they get Andy to translate. And then, um... Why are you pausing? Caboose is not going to interrupt you this time. No, that was just for dramatic effect. He's pregnant. Oh, good. Wait, what? <laughs> Preggers. <laughs> Alright, are we paying for this service? Because if we are, I want a refund. Yeah, so back in the swamp, Tucker kept waking up with the alien looming over him, and it turns out that he was infected by the alien with a parasitic embryo that is now using Tucker as the host, which... Y yes, he does indeed give birth to it. Oh, and then Donut gets crushed by a ship from command after Sarge called for reinforcements. This series, man, it is just so much sometimes. I swear we're getting to the good stuff soon. After hearing the crash, Church comes over to investigate and then claims dibs on the ship. He attempts to use Sheila to intimidate the Reds, but something's up with her. And given that Doc has seemingly returned to normal, we can make the safe assumption that O'Malley's jumped out of him and into something with a bit more firepower. Where's Tucker? Still in a coma. Great. Tucker's out, Sheila's on the fritz, and now Doc is babysitting. Caboose? If we survive the next five minutes, I'll be fucking amazed. When the Reds attempt to get Donut to rescue himself, thinking that they can use the myth of crises giving people super strength, the ship finally opens up and a soldier in yellow armor appears. This is Kikaina, Griff's little sister. She is incredibly dim and a bit of a himbo, but I find her to be endearing. As is discovered later, she's also one of the few female characters in this series whose identity isn't defined by her relationship to the men in her life. In fact, while she joined the army to follow in her older brother's footsteps, she never does anything because she feels the need to impress him, or anyone else for that matter. 
Kakaina explains that she was sent to Blood Gulch in response to the death of her new unit's commander to replace whoever was promoted as private. Because this is the Red Team, they go ahead and treat Sarge as if he's died, and Simmons immediately makes a play to replace him as the Red Team's leader. But Kakaina was actually sent to be a member of Blue Team, but because she's entirely colorblind, she doesn't realize that her brother and the others are Reds. The arbitrariness of this war has never been more clear until this moment, where we see two members of the exact same family but on opposite sides of the conflict for seemingly no reason whatsoever. Realizing that he's just buried his commanding officer alive, Simmons goes to dig up Sarge, while Griff escorts his sister to the other side of the canyon. As it turns out, when the ship crashed, Donut wasn't killed on impact, and he was actually forced through the ground into an underground cave system. So when the Reds buried Sarge, he also wound up falling into the caves, and now he thinks he's died and gone to hell because he's alone with Donut. Wait a minute, afterlife? Underground cave? What if this isn't heaven? What if it's... No, it couldn't be. Could it? Oh, hey, Sarge. What are you doing down here? It is. Oh, it is. Griff and Simmons go down into the cave to retrieve their leader, and while they're waiting at the rendezvous point, the two get knocked out and Griff is kidnapped. Tex returns to Blood Gulch to track down Omega and immediately recognizes that he's no longer in dock. Not trusting the Blues, she attacks their base until Kakaina yells at her to stop shooting. It doesn't stop her from being hostile, but it does get Church and Tucker to realize the reason why Sheila's been acting so weird. Thanks to Caboose's habit of making friends with hostiles, they use him to distract Sheila while Texas deactivates her. And just as Sheila is about to tell Caboose where Omega is, she's shut down. With Sheila out of commission due to her fried hardware, they start the process of transferring her programming into the ship that brought Kakaina. While they're waiting, Tex explains to Church what she's been doing since she left Tucker and Caboose. She ran off to chase after Wyoming, thinking that he might lead her to Omega, and she teamed up with her former freelancer ally York and his AI Delta to do so. Church asks if Carolina was with him, but Texas says that she's already dead. Unfortunately, when they had Wyoming cornered, he teleported away. When asked about it, Tex explains to Church that the AI that Wyoming received was Gamma, at which point he makes the connection. <sighs> I gotta make a phone call. Hello? Hello, this is Church, Gary. Or should I call you Gamma? Have you been lying to us? Lying is such a shit no concept. I mean human concept. You're a computer. I thought computers can't lie. They can if they are programmed to lie. Were you programmed to lie? No. God damn it. Meanwhile, the Reds find Griff, who tells them that while he was kidnapped and drugged, Andy the Bomb was there and translating for an alien. The Reds scout through the caves and find a console with monitors displaying footage from across the canyon, including both the Red and the Blue bases. Church gets a call from Vic, who's actually an AI in charge of monitoring the canyon, and tells him that the Blues need to attack the Red base so that the Reds might stop poking at his equipment. Sarge gives him some motivational speech to kick his men into gear, and they use the dead bodies of Texas and Church that have fallen through the ground to estimate where Blue Base is. But Simmons rightly points out that there should be a third body from when Captain Flowers died. The Blues are split up into two teams, with Church, Tucker, and Texas off to the Red Base, while Kakaina and Doc go through the caves. Caboose has been left behind to keep an eye on Sheila and to make sure that she's transferred into the ship, and let Texas know when she wakes up. When she does, Sheila tells Caboose that O'Malley is in Blue Team's leader. Tex is immediately hostile towards Church, but he explains that, technically, he was never officially promoted to captain. <laughs> Which means... Kid has go. Hi there. I don't think we've met. I'm Captain Butch Flowers. Apparently, this new alien came to find the one who died, so he rezzed Flowers in order to help him out, but then Omega jumped into Flowers. Wyoming shows up and Gamma steals the tank after Church attempts to covertly get Caboose to come and help them. Tucker gets confused by the situation as Wyoming takes out Texas and Gamma shoots Caboose as he's coming over the hill. Time rewinds whenever Wyoming is defeated, and Tucker is the only one to recognize what's happening to them until he finally gets the jump on him and uses Sheila to contain the Gamma AI. Meanwhile... What a glorious day to be red! And the best part of it all is that the Blues are finally going to be driven out of the canyon, and we get to sit on the sidelines! Man, someone does all the battling and we just have to kick back and let them take the glory while we enjoy the benefits! We don't have to do anything! <sighs> you know, one of these days, I don't know when, I'm gonna learn to shut my fucking mouth. Because Sarge wants the Reds to be the ones to kill the Blues, they get involved and start taking out the copies of Wyoming that are attacking them. Caboose picks a fight with them, and nothing really happens because they're all idiots. Church tries to get some exposition out of the last Wyoming copy, but Tucker beats him to the punch. The freelancer is after Junior because the aliens believe that the kid is the last part of the failed prophecy, and that he can become a religious figure for them. So if they can get Omega to possess the kid, they can use him to take over the aliens from the inside out by using their own religion against them. 
That, that got a bit intense all of a sudden, huh? Unfortunately, now that Texas understands what the freelancers are after, she sides with Wyoming and tries to get Omega to return to her by turning on her radio and broadcasting her location to lure him out. Flowers gets killed again, and the Reds put Andy onto the ship in order to get him to blow up and stop Tex from leaving. All the while, Omega bounces around between members of the cast, each of them briefly turning into their evil counterparts, except for Church. You know, I, I don't really feel all that different. No, feels pretty much the same. That's kind of weird, huh? Until finally, Omega finds Texas. She takes Wyoming's helmet and ushers the aliens onto the ship. Tex, don't do this! Lift off. Goodbye. We have to stop her right now! No problemo, Blue! Andy, there! I'm here, Coach! What's going on? Tex is hooking up Wyoming's helmet to the computer. Ready for your job, soldier? You bet! Alright then, son. Do what you were born to do. Deadly. Hey, you want me to start from ten or three? Come on, let's build it up a little bit. Suspense, it'll kill him! Ten! I told you to disable the Nine! Not destroy it! Eight. Oh, well, score one for the rest Seven. of us. What about my kids? Six. All right, Five. score two. Four. Andy, do not Three. detonate. Can you see her two. heading? Do you know where she's going? One. Tex? Boo, no explosion. That sucked. Ha-ha, <laughs> blammo! Wow, that explosion was awesome. What explosion? I didn't see it. Do it again. Uh, Church, what should we do? Do whatever you want. I'm going home. And then it's quiet. In the aftermath, things have mostly gone back to the way that they were. There are two sides of a war that doesn't matter, each with a base in a box canyon in the middle of nowhere. And this could have been the end, but it wasn't. The Blood Gulch Chronicles does a great job of setting up our characters and getting the audience prepared for the types of shenanigans that we can expect from future seasons, though the plot becomes a lot more solid and centered as we go forward. The machinima is really well shot, and after just a few episodes, it's really easy to forget that these are essentially pixelated puppets, and you get immersed into this absurd world. The animation limitations force them to get clever with their writing, even though there are still plot holes and some aspects of it don't make much sense. A lot of the jokes have aged like milk, but for me, it doesn't take away the enjoyment that I get from watching these assholes fumble their way through the circumstances that they found themselves in. It's just a lot of fun, and I managed to get really attached to each member of the main cast for various reasons, despite it and because of their flaws. And yes, Caboose is my favorite. These earlier seasons are a bit messy, but I think that getting the opportunity to watch artists grow with their work holds a lot of charm. It's like reading a webcomic and seeing the creator get more consistent with their anatomy and shading as the chapters go on. When consuming media that's more or less made in real time, you get to see what winds up left behind and what's chosen to stay. There are a ton of moments from this arc that will become incredibly plot relevant in just a few seasons that you wouldn't realize were important unless you went back and took the time to make those connections. And I love that! I really love that you get this glimpse into the creative process. I firmly believe that art is allowed to be flawed because it means that there's always opportunities to grow, and growth is a theme that gets emphasized throughout the series. There's always an opportunity to take a step forward and become someone that you're proud of. After all, mistakes are the dirt that we grow from. <laughs> Wait. Oh, damn it, that's a line from season 16, and I'm not going there in this, but god damn it. For a majority of the people out there who have watched Red vs. Blue, it's likely that these seasons are all that they watched. These are the classics, and if you don't get through them, it's unlikely that you're going to continue to what comes next. Which <laughs> seriously sucks, because where we're going from here, it's fucking brilliant. In the aftermath of Season 5, a new character is introduced to our cast in the miniseries Recovery 1. This four-part special centers around a character named Agent Washington a freelancer who's been tasked with recovering equipment from his fellow former agents, all of whom have been killed under mysterious circumstances and had their AI taken from them. On this recovery mission, Wash's former ally York has been killed, but his AI was left behind. Delta shows a strong attachment to his deceased companion, likely for having kept them safe since they left the program. Delta is confused as to why he's not been destroyed. When an assignee is killed in action, protocol dictates that all intelligence programs be Yeah, destroyed. that's what they told me at first, too but you were encrypted until you could be recovered. I'm here to recover you. Recovery carries risk. Destruction ensures that an AI will not fall into enemy hands. Are you complaining? Not at all. Just noting a discrepancy. What do you want from me, guy? You cost a lot of money, okay? It's cheaper to recover you than it is to delete you. Their discussion is cut short when Wash is attacked. He takes Delta with him as he escapes. 
As he receives another recovery beacon, the remains of his old friend are blown up to ensure that freelancer equipment doesn't fall into enemy hands. Agent South Dakota is standing shell-shocked over the body of her twin brother when Wash finds her. North was still in possession of his AI, Theta, but like the others before Delta, he's gone now. South is allowed a minute alone to make peace with her brother while Wash receives his orders. Though bound by protocol, Washington fakes her death in order to get her to trust him. He intends to use her to lure out who or whatever has been hunting down their fellow agents. South is immediately skeptical as to his motivations, noting that the AI that he was given, Epsilon, went insane and attempted to kill itself while implanted in Wash's head. Weren't you certified Article 12 after that? Unfit for duty. The people who certified me were the same people that uncertified me. Which, once they needed me, they did. Funny how the system works. South reluctantly agrees to go with him. The mission to find their thief doesn't end well. Delta is implanted in South, and when their attacker finally catches up to them, she crosses Wash by shooting him in the back. She tricks the attacker by using Wash and the promise of his equipment as a lure for her to get to safety. As she leaves him behind, it becomes a double cross as it's revealed that she was a recovery agent as well, and now that she has the AI that she was initially denied, she's cutting ties. Washington is left for dead. In just a few short episodes, the series takes on a much darker and more serious tone, giving us a protagonist who's been burned by the people that he works for, and as a result, has become bitter yet duty-bound. He's a soldier committed to the cause, and his role in the story is only just beginning. To the director of Project Freelancer from the Oversight Subcommittee Chairman. Captain Rebus, we've got something over here. Dear Director, I want to thank you in advance for your openness in response to our subcommittee's request for more information. We were disappointed that your recovery force reported a total loss at Outpost 17B. We had hoped there would be at least one soldier left that could shed some light on the situation. I know that your agency has enjoyed a high degree of freedom with very little scrutiny in the past few years. It is not our intention to disrupt such a progressive military program, but instead to find a way we can work together in a manner that befits all our responsibilities. I am certain that you will agree, and we look forward to making this review process as painless as we possibly can. Season 6 announces its change in direction from the very start, beginning with a complicated mission animated sequence that is made of three different takes layered over each other to create scenes filled with military personnel and equipment. Voiceover from a character that we've never heard of, but will become very important over time, plays as we focus on a soldier in red armor. Outpost 17B has been decimated by some kind of infection. A single member of the red team survived and was brought in for questioning. He explains what happened and how the infection led to the blues killing each other before his team was inflicted as well. And just when it seemed like it was over, something attacked their base and searched the bodies for equipment. Agent Washington is present in the interrogation room, and when the counselor directs the soldier to be taken away, Wash confirms that this entity the soldier mentioned matches what he encountered during his previous assignment. This being is known as the Meta. It was only thanks to a healing unit that he took from York's gear that Wash is even still alive. He resents the program from using him, but he wants revenge. That's enough for him to stick with them for as long as it takes to find Agent South again. The Meta has taken the Omega AI, so now Wash has to track down the people who were last in contact with it and Agent Texas. Our Reds and Blues. The very fun and often ridiculous story about two groups of idiots in a box canyon has taken a hell of a turn in a very short amount of time, but the shenanigans do quickly return. From here on out, we follow Washington as he makes an effort to track down our colorful cast and get some answers. A response from the director of Project Freelancer. Dear Chairman, while I am obligated to assist your investigation, I ask that you not waste my time with irrelevant questions. My agency is normally unconcerned with such minute directives as troop reassignment. Except, of course, in the most critical of matters. 
Washington's first lead takes him to Blood Gulch at Post Alpha. Command declared the base obsolete over a year ago, and the soldiers stationed there have been scattered to new postings. Sarge, being the paranoid idiot that he is, stayed behind in a stalemate against Kakaina. Fortunately for Wash, Sarge intercepted the blue team's reassignment orders, which then takes him to Caboose, whose new commander is more than happy to get rid of him thanks to a number of friendly fire incidents that led to Caboose being tied up in their brig. Wash is immediately confused, given that Caboose is... Caboose? This here is Special Agent Washington from Blue Command. He has something fantastic he needs to talk to you about. Command? Oh no. They never have good news. Did somebody die? Was it my mom? Is she dead? Or my dad? Did my dad die again? Oh no. What is this? I, I don't... <laughs> you see? He's yours now. <laughs> no take backs. Well, he's Caboose. But he did learn where Church was reassigned, so Wash takes Caboose with him because of his personal experiences with Omega. The two head to Church's new base, and along the way, Caboose explains that Church was the person on the team with the most experience with Omega and Texas. When they arrive, Church tries to shoot the intruders and... I know that voice! Church! Church! It's me! Your all-time best friend! Caboose? Caboose, is that you? Yes! Church, it's me! I have missed you so much! It has been so long! Did you miss me? Fuck! I missed him! I know you did! It goes about as well as you would expect. Washington gets Church to let them in, and Church tells them that he's been here alone for the last 14 months. Wash then gets a message to return with the Blues to Outpost 17B. Church is initially reluctant, but his eagerness to get closure on Tex's death is enough to get him to follow willingly. It's at this point that we finally get to see our antagonist. The Meta has intercepted Washington's communications with Command, and he splices together a message to Blood Gulch Red Base in order to interfere with Washington's investigation. We also see Agent South and Delta again the two after Wash, but not realizing that they're being followed as well. By the time that the team makes it to 17B, the outpost is on lockdown by the UNSC and Wash isn't allowed to get through. Not caring about military protocol, Washington infiltrates the scene and creates a distraction so that Church and Caboose can follow him over. He gains access to Sheila's damaged programming and the ship's last data logs. The aliens seem to have escaped, but Texas went down in the crash. Church confirms that the events that happened here, with the soldiers losing themselves at the base, matches their own experiences with Omega. The suit hopping was a trait that Omega developed during their time with the program, but he always chose to stay close to Tex. Church asks Washington who his AI was, and pieces together his reputation from the stories that Tex told him of her time with the project. Okay, okay, I knew I'd heard your name before. You're that guy that went nuts, right? I didn't do anything. My AI lost control of itself. Right. It just happened to do it while it was inside your head. Right. We have a lot of common, Agent Washington. No, we don't. And don't ever say that again. Before they can get into the outpost blue base to look for Texas' body, Washington gets a call from command that they picked up another recovery beacon. It's south in Delta. Washington is one of my favorite characters in this show, and a lot of that stems from the way that he's developed over time and how elements of his past are revealed. Recovery One gave us the basis for his tenuous relationship to the freelancer program, and their being under close scrutiny due to the meta's actions has created an impulsiveness to cut their loose ends. Wash was very nearly one of those loose ends. As far as the writing goes, I think it's a great idea to bring in a character of his background and force him to have to interact with the series core cast members, especially characters like Church and Caboose. Their weird friendship stands diametrically opposed to everything that Wash is trained for. They're not capable soldiers, and they actually suck at their job, and their ability to work as a team is tenuous at best. They're simple, though not uncomplicated, and now they're traveling with someone whose toxic and militant apathy has turned into a quiet vengeance. The problem with the drive for revenge is that if and when you finally get to that point of fulfilling it, it doesn't actually allow you to move forward. Revenge doesn't create catharsis because you've effectively trapped yourself in the circumstances that brought you to this point to begin with. But the meta is after Agent South when we catch up to them. She's about to cut her losses and leave Delta behind in an act of self-preservation when Wash and the Blues show up. Caboose... helps. See that purple one? She's on our team! You should help her! Okay! Um, she got in the way when I was trying to help her. And then we get my personal favorite running joke in the series. Caboose! Toss that grenade! That was the worst throw ever. Of all time. Using Omega's cloaking tech and Gamma's time distortion unit, the meta is able to get away. Because of South's condition, Delta is moved to a new host. Washington orders one of the blues to take him. 
Church isn't sure that he'd be able to carry Delta given the lackluster experience when Omega jumped into him, but Caboose helpfully volunteers. Wash is about to drag South along with them before Delta reveals that her attempts at a betrayal, including that she was responsible for her brother's death by allowing him to be killed to save herself. As a being of logic with a sense of self-preservation, Delta suggests that South shouldn't be allowed a chance to turn on them, so Wash shoots her. You guys are some cold motherfuckers. In the scene that follows, we learn a bit more about the freelancer AIs. They were responsible for running the agent's specialized equipment, but while powerful on their own, they're only fragments of much stronger artificial intelligence. Washington forces Delta to shut down before he speaks too deeply of the Alpha. Wash explains that the fragments have all had an obsession with the AI that they were made from, and that due to restrictions, the program was only ever able to get their hands on a single AI. So they copied it, creating from Alpha, Beta, and so on. Some of the freelancers had been influenced by their AI partners to find the Alpha, and broke into a base to do so. Wash is cut off by another recovery beacon. His contact with Command finally gives him an ID on their target. The meta is Freelancer Agent Main. Though caught off guard by the revelation, Church accurately deduces that due to all of the equipment that the meta has stolen, he's probably in need of more power to keep it running. And the Blues have an idea of where he's headed. The old power plant from a couple seasons back is our new set piece. Wash takes one side of the facility and instructs Church and Caboose to take the other side, refusing Delta when he pushes to accompany him. As they're getting into position, Church questions Delta for answers about the Alpha and the Freelancer program. Delta goes into further detail about the series of failed experiments that occurred towards the end of the program, including Agent Carolina, who had been given two AIs. But the strain that it put on her mind was too great. Where only two was more than one person could handle, the meta is now in position of nearly six, and the pressure that he must be undergoing would be significant. A fight ensues, and I just have to take a moment to gush, because the machinima in this season has really gotten so impressive. The Blood Gold Chronicles didn't have a lot going in terms of action. More often, it was running away from things that were shooting at them. The skill was shown in the script, the blocking, and the camera work. In this season, we get to see them flex as they create action sequences using a flurry of camera shots. This encounter alone has at least 34 shots cut together. The camera hardly stays still as it follows Wash in the meta's battle, with high angles, close-ups, shots from behind a wire fence, dolly shots, and more with grenade explosion effects to really help convey the intensity of the moment. This technique is used in a lot of actual action movies. If you've ever taken a film class where you're required to dissect a scene and the camera choices that they made, then you probably know that choosing basically any scene from a superhero movie is going to fuck up your attempts at making other plans. It's really so satisfying to watch these guys become masters of their creative medium. As the meta gets away, Caboose and Delta attempt to get into a flanking position, and Church finally manages to land a shot on someone for the first time in years. And then... Hey, do you hear something? No? Wait, yeah. What is that? Music? What? Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Woohoo! Crap, yeah, what do we do with here? Like a... uh, it's Red Army! It's nothing that's gonna stop us now! It seems as though Sarge followed through on that message that the meta sent him, and we learn that you don't split the party, because Caboose is stopped by the meta. God damn it, this scene stresses me out now. And the fucking music, holy shit. Quick aside, but if you've taken even a passing glance at my channel, then you'll probably have gathered that I have a tendency to get obsessed with musical scoring. This series is not immune to that either, because for a web series that got its start as a spoof of a Halo multiplayer mode, the music has absolutely no right being as well implemented as it is. The band who worked with Rooster Teeth for the score, Trocadero, wrote some of the most incredible pieces for this series. Most of the score is instrumental versions of the band's existing music, but then there are themes like Agent Tex's guitar line that plays whenever she appears, and once you recognize it, you'll hear it and immediately 
immediately expect her to come around a corner to shoot someone. The meta's theme this season is so damn satisfying to me because we so rarely spend more than a couple seconds at a time face to face with him. The camera instead chooses to frame him as this mysterious threat, either lurking or looming in the frame, only small portions of him shown at any given time. And this musical sting plays to herald his scene introductions. Obviously not every character is given a light motif like this, but it's practically masterful each time that they are. Dear director, I feel you are avoiding the question. If this target was already in possession of an AI unit, how was he able to secure an additional unit from Agent South? Would not that verify, as we indicated earlier, that your program now runs experiments with more than one artificial intelligence? If so, where did these additional AI come from? And more importantly, how did your agency procure them? The next few scenes present us with a quick backstory on our reds, from Sarge getting the message to leaving Lopez behind so that he can find Griffin Simmons and recruit them on his quest for vengeance against their old enemy. The two agree to go with him, mostly because they're about to be executed by their team because Griff is a terrible sergeant and sold their ammo to the other team. Sarge is incapable of recognizing that Griff was promoted, but he drags the two along with him to intercept Agent Washington at the power station. Wash postulates that the Reds might be working for the meta, but given their experience with them, Church finds that highly unlikely. For now, their mission is to rescue Caboose. Wash is able to read the vitals of his teammates, though it doesn't work for Church. Yeah, uh, I'm sure there's a perfect logical explanation for that. The meta manages to hook up to the station's generators. Wash gets the Reds to stand down, convincing them that he's with command. Griff refuses to follow through with Sarge's idiocy and decides that he'll ask the Red Team space for help, which... It doesn't end well. Now that they're all in danger from the same threat, the Reds and Blues are once again forced to work together to avoid death by freelancer mistakes. Washington makes it to Caboose and stabilizes him with the healing unit before returning to assist the band of idiots that is formed around him. He manages to land a few hits on the meta before it uses the distortion unit to get away again. With everyone now recruited to fight this new threat, their next task is to rouse Caboose. Why don't you do that thing? You know, the thing you do. The ghost thing. Yeah, this guy doesn't know about that, so... I don't really want to let him know and freak him out. Why don't you go keep him occupied? I'll see what I can do. Hey, Agent Washington! I think it turns out we do know a medic after all! While the rest of the guys go to try and distract Washington, Church goes ghost and possesses Caboose. Inside, he finds a message left behind for him by Delta, with calculated responses based on how Church would ask them. And Delta tells him to tell Wash that memory is the key. Memory is the key. Memory is the key? Memory what does that mean? Wash will know. Simmons is really bad at distracting Wash. The conversation about how Church is actually a dead guy quickly devolves into an argument. Washington implies that the robot kits that each of the bases possessed weren't standard issue equipment, and then reveals the truth. The red and blue bases are simulation outposts intended for freelancer training. In the stunned silence that follows, he orders the reds to get the vehicles prepared, and Church gives him Delta's message. Delta was right. Memory is the key. But what does that mean? It means that only one thing remembers everything about these AI and where they come from. It will know how to stop them. We need to unlock the Alpha. The Alpha? And that means we're going home. We're going to command. The jeeps that they used to get here are out of commission, but 17B is close enough. While the Reds and Wash are occupied with trying to find a new ride, Church leaves his body behind in order to infiltrate the blue base and look for Tex's body. Since the two of them haven't been particularly bound by their physical forms, he assumes that she has to be here somewhere. But Wash interrupts him, and then single-handedly takes out the airship that was firing on the Reds. The Reds initially refuse to accompany him on his mission to infiltrate the command facility, but... I'm a freelancer! Not a rank, dude. The other freelancers never gave orders. They just offered to trade favors. Okay, then let's bargain. What do you want? A robot. A milkshake. All right, we talked about it, and we figured out what we want. All right, let's have it. We want you to demo Griff. Done. What? Another wasted opportunity. With the Reds back on board, Wash still needs to find a way into the base, and this beautiful bastard has the perfect solution. I think he's bluffing. No, it's, it's a really good idea. We drive there. Yeah. He was bluffing. We're going to Freelancer City, right? The place where Freelancer's from. And this is a Freelancer car. If they think that we are Freelancers because we are in their car, they will just let us right in. But you don't look like Freelancers or recovery agents. They can't see inside of a tank. The plan goes off with only a small hitch.
Washington instructs the Reds and Caboose to stay and wait for their signal to start preparations for escaping the facility, while he uses his clearance to get close to the storage facility. Washington will pose Church as a prisoner so that he can come with him. With not much else to do but cause some trouble, Simmons pokes around inside the military's personnel files. And from this point on, this is what the role of the Red Team is in the series. The things they do, either to fuck with the Blues or accidentally do so, become secondary plot conflicts. The effects of their actions cause further disruption to the events of the series' main plot, and help push the series forward by forcing the characters to be active protagonists. I think that this is really clever. Seeing these characters that we've come to know fairly intimately continue to be a controlling force in the narrative is what makes it fun to watch, rather than all the plot happening around them, and causing them to simply be reactionary. It also keeps their role in the story relevant, as we move further and further away from that box canyon in the middle of nowhere. With the Reds now left to their own devices, they take the chance to poke at the information in the terminals that they've been left with. They need to avoid drawing attention to themselves, but there's no harm in causing a bit of destruction to the people that have screwed them over up until this point. Sarge being Sarge, he gets the brilliant idea to access the blue personnel records and delete them, and in so doing, securing victory over their enemies. It makes about as much sense as any of his other plans, so Simmons gets to hacking. Washington takes Church further into the command center, using his clearance to get them into the storage facility. It goes smoothly. Mostly. Absolutely. Call it in. Let me just- NOW! <laughs> Uh, hey, can I get a little help? I'm out of bullets. Thanks. Eventually, they reach the storage room where Project Freelancer has kept the failed AI fragments. And among them is Epsilon. Church is confused about why they came all this way for a broken AI fragment. So Wash tells them the truth. The project was only ever able to get their hands on a single AI, but every AI is based on a human mind. So the project's director had a theory. Since they couldn't copy it, they tried the next best thing. Break it down into pieces, similar to the way that trauma on an underdeveloped consciousness causes dissociative identity disorder. They tortured the alpha until it fractured. Its code was broken up into fragments. As an aside, I don't know what research went into the writing for this plotline, but it is bizarrely one of the most respectful interpretations of DID that I know of. Obviously, a lot is fantasticized, and the analogy isn't one-to-one, -one, since this is science fiction after all, and the Alpha was a digital consciousness. But it gets right how DID is caused to begin with. Trauma. And the fragments were all part of a whole, while still being their own individuals, similar to DID alters. And they all played a role within the system to keep the host, in this case Alpha, safe from what was happening to it. But instead of remaining as a system, the director was able to isolate this broken code away from Alpha and chipped more and more away from it. Delta was the logic, able to grasp what was happening to it, so he was created to contain that experience. Omega was rage, Gamma was the ability to lie to protect itself, and so on. Eventually, the Alpha was breaking down more and more, and without the fragments to keep it safe from what it was going through, it was forced to purge its memories. This created Epsilon, and left the Alpha far weaker and without an understanding of its new nature. When Washington was implanted with this fragment, he experienced the full extent of what the director had done to them. This experience nearly broke Wash, and this was the failure that led to the project discontinuing implantations. Now with the truth, Washington has stayed with the program in order to make things right, and find a way to take down the director. Well, what about the meta? How do we stop him? Isn't that the point? I thought only the Alpha could do that. Are we going to find it or not? No. No! After the first attack on command, they moved it. They knew the AI would just convince their freelancers to come looking for it again. So they put it in a place where they didn't think anyone could find it. But where? Shouldn't we be there instead of here? Church, I need you to listen to me. Delta was dealt logic. He was able to figure out things before anyone else. It's why he left a message for you in a way that he knew only you could find and in a way that let me see you getting it. What are you saying? I'm saying I know what you are, even if you don't. Why you can seemingly live without a body. What? It's why they stuck you in some useless backwater canyon where no one ever goes. Then why they transferred every person in your outpost to a different base than you. I've been here 14 months. What? Over a year? By yourself? It's why you always agreed with everything Delta said. I think we should simply be happy it is gone. That makes sense to me. Why you didn't feel anything when Omega got inside your head. It feels pretty much the same, that's... Kind of weird, huh? Why you can jump from person to person the way it can. It all adds up then. Omega was the one who inherited that trait. Church, there's no such thing as ghosts. You're one of them. You're an AI. You are the Alpha. This reveal is truly incredible. 
it doesn't matter how many times I rewatch it, I just get so excited. Musically, this is fantastic. Playing the meta's theme under the dialogue is so significant because the meta's ultimate goal is to become human, and the alpha is as close to that as an AI could ever possibly be. The intensity of the scoring pulls together all of these little foreshadowing pieces that completely transforms the series as we know it. Church's death was never meant to have this sort of effect on the series. The show was only ever planned to be about 8 episodes long, and it wasn't until later that you started seeing them take what they'd written and twist it to fit this new role. This type of retroactive continuity is something that, as a writer, I've experienced a lot with my own projects. You realize, oh shit, this is actually something really cool. So you take it and you run with it. A twist like this is really fun as a viewer because you can go back and every innocuous moment that at first felt like a joke becomes something worth paying attention to. The blue base being named Blood Gulch Outpost Alpha, having the robot kits available, the way that Church was able to possess other characters and go into their heads like Omega, even the fact that he in particular absolutely sucks at shooting people becomes a reference to Isaac Asimov with this revelation. Epsilon remembers him and attempts to communicate with the flashes that he sends out. Memory is the key, and Wash is the only other person who is able to remember what the director did to Alpha to create the fragments. This is their chance to take Freelancer to task for the crimes that they committed and the torture that they enacted. Dear Director, It is now clear that your agency and its primary program, Project Freelancer, have abused the trust and freedoms that the Oversight Subcommittee has provided you. Your abuse of the Alpha AI will now become the subject of a criminal investigation. I'm sorry, Director, but you have seen the end of my patience. Of course, because this is a comedy series first and foremost, this reveal is almost immediately undercut by Church completely refuting this with the insistence that he's a real person with memories of a childhood and having been human all his life, and that being a ghost makes a hell of a lot more sense than being a computer program. He refuses to believe Agent Washington, and thanks to the res deletion of the Blue Team's records, Church is unable to disprove him. But the command center is under siege by the meta. Wash has been banking on it following them to act as a distraction while the rest of the team can make their escape. Washington wants Church to be with him when they make their last stand, believing that this should matter to him more than anyone else. But Church resists. He still doesn't believe anything that Wash has said. His self-continuity doesn't line up with the idea that he's anything other than a guy that was killed by his idiot teammates. He refuses to go with him, leaving the Reds and Caboose to take Epsilon and get out. Washington's betrayal was anticipated by the counselor and the director. When he refuses to stand down, the director overrides the safety protocols that were keeping Maine out, and Washington is shot. Though the director treats him as though he's still an agent, the AI fragments are still obsessed with finding the Alpha. They believe that he's here and that their priority is to find him. And he is. Whether because Church sincerely wanted answers or just because he doesn't believe that he's in any danger, Church has chosen to go with Wash to the facility's failsafe. How much time do you need? Whatever you can get me. When the EMP goes off- When it goes off, I'll be fine. It only affects computers, remember? And I am a motherfucking ghost. Church buys watch time by keeping the meta distracted while he ensures that the failsafe can go off. As the EMP takes out all the tech at the facility, it radiates outwards and we watch our cast as they're caught in it. Caboose just narrowly makes it out with Epsilon before they drive off a cliff. And we never find out if Church is satisfied with what he learned from this. Whatever he experienced inside of Maine's head, either reconnecting or rejecting the broken fragments of himself, is left as a mystery. And this is where his story ends, protecting someone that he didn't believe in, but selfish enough to try and find answers at the risk of his own life. Dear Chairman, I am disappointed by your decision to press charges, but I am not surprised. My only hope is that the courts will see the matters differently than you have. You see, I never had the chance to serve in battle, nor did fate provide me the opportunity to sacrifice myself for humanity as it did for so many others in the Great War. Someone extremely dear to me was lost very early in my life. My mind has always plagued me with the question, if the choice had been placed in my hands, could I have saved her? The memory of her has haunted me my entire life, and more so in these last few years than I could ever have imagined. But given the events of these past few weeks, 
I feel confident that had I been given the chance, I would have made those sacrifices myself. Had I only the chance. I know that you disagreed with my methods and that others will as well. This is beyond my control. However, I cannot imagine that any court would be able to convict me, no matter how low their opinion of my actions might be. You must understand one basic fact for all this to make sense, my dear chairman. These AI, they all come from somewhere. They are all based on a person. Our Alpha was no exception. And while the law has many penalties for the atrocities we inflict on others, there are no punishments for the terrors that we inflict on ourselves. So you send your men. They won't find themselves in a fight. They'll only find an old man. An old man tired, but satisfied he did his duty. An old man wear it from a mind more filled with memory than it is with hope. Okay. Time to see if this works. Sincerely yours, the former director of Project Freelancer, Dr. Leonard Church. It's hard to imagine that in those early days, Rooster Teeth would have ever imagined that this would be their creation. This season establishes the setup for all of the seasons that follow, and the reveals completely transform the series into a sci-fi epic with major consequences for our cast. But even with all of the major reveals, it always manages to find a balance in tone, staying true to its nature without being afraid to get serious. The drama makes the jokes stand out, and the jokes actually make the stakes feel higher. Instead of dissonance, the fact that there are times when even serious characters like Wash are able to make jokes meshes everything together in a cohesive unit. In the aftermath of the destruction of Project Freelancer, Outpost 17B, now also known as Valhalla, has been given to our Reds and Caboose as thanks for their assistance in revealing their corruption. Sarge is attempting to get their comm tower back online so that he can call Lopez and get him to leave Blood Gulch to come make repairs on their equipment. Lopez arrives quickly and not only takes care of their generators, but builds an entire holographic simulation room underneath the base so that Sarge can continue prototyping a vehicle that uses an EMP as a weapon. During a round of testing, a dehydrated donut appears in the chamber and gives them a cryptic message. Griff! He needs help! It's under the sand! Find him! Oh boy. That sounds like something that's gonna keep us busy for a few months. Meanwhile, Caboose is alone at his base. Without the records of the blue team, no one has been reassigned to join his side of this fake conflict, and as such, he's been left to his own devices. In this case, the unit that's housing Epsilon. After losing his best friend, Caboose is trying to bring Church back by bringing Epsilon online using pieces from Tex's old robot body and parts from Sheila. The memory unit seems to respond well to being spoken to, and Caboose has been telling his stories about his experience in Blood Gulch. He's given the space to continue because Sarge has realized that even though they technically don't have an enemy anymore, they still haven't technically won because if there's only red team, then they're not fighting against anyone, which means it's like a stalemate against nobody. <laughs> Because if we defeated them, it wouldn't even count. And that's the best part about winning a war, getting the points. Bingo! No, why would we try to win? It's only what we're supposed to do. We need to find a way to get them back in the database first! So, your plan is to hold off our attack until our superior officers take notice of one of the teams in this canyon? And notice them well enough to actually go out of their way to add them back into the database? Or do anything at all in any way to formally recognize one of us in an official capacity? You got it! This is probably the single greatest plan I've ever heard in my entire life. You would think that, kiss-ass. Simmons, can it! And thank you, Private... Uh, Griff? Ugh. You're... welcome? Am I saying that right? The fact that Griff and Simmons have managed to swap personality traits in a way that is wholly believable is very fun to me. They're staying in character with their reactions to the situation that they've given themselves, but now Griff is the one who is eager to ensure that the plan works, while Simmons is disillusioned by his superior stupidity and has lost all motivation to continue kissing up to Sarge. It's a great way of reinventing the characters without actually having to do anything, allowing the audience to see how they respond to the circumstances that the season is going to throw at them. It's also really interesting to see Caboose in a position where he's fully competent and in control of his goals. His role is still the team idiot, but he's one of the most technologically literate members of the cast. 
While it often doesn't seem like it, he does have a very firm grasp on reality as he's lived through it. Hey, are you okay? Just a little weak. Where's Church? Church? Oh, uh, he's out here right now. Where is he? Uh, he's up. He, that's kind of, uh, uh... It turns out he was running a computer program based on some guy who ran a freelancer project, then he went with Agent Washington, he's a freelancer, and destroyed all the other AIs that were left. Well, almost all. Donut, unfortunately, is still weak from his journey to reach Valhalla, and though Caboose is capable, he's still... not especially bright socially, so he misunderstands Donut's attempts to relay that Tucker is in a desert and needs assistance. But he and Donut are friends, so he lets him stay at the empty base while he continues working on his project. Sarge being Sarge believes that Caboose has kidnapped Donut. Hey Sarge, maybe there's a ransom. Good thinking! What is it you want, Blue? What do I want? Do you have any cookies? What are your demands? You have to give us your demands! I demand cookies! Now you're just toying with us. Your depravity knows no bounds! Yeah! Well, at least I don't go around. Knocking on people's non doors and promising them cookies. And then not giving them cookies! When Donut finally wakes up, he explains that he was relocated to a different base in the desert, and Caboose gives him the rundown of everything that's happened last season. Donut wonders if they could get help on their new mission for Tucker by calling Agent Washington for assistance. While Caboose and the Reds were given Valhalla to keep them out of trouble, Washington was thrown into prison for his affiliation with Project Freelancer. His hopes of taking down the director have backfired, with the director having evaded incarceration and gone into hiding. Washington was left as the fall guy for having the most information about the project, and for being the last person the military knows of to have been in possession of, of Epsilon. He's baffled when Caboose calls him, but actually expresses a moment of sincerity by asking if he's okay. Caboose, as we know, is perfectly fine, and he even offers Wash a place at his base with him. Because he's in prison, Wash can't exactly help them. But given what he knows about Caboose, he's already guessed that he's kept the Epsilon unit. Wash is a bust, but Donut still offers to help with rebuilding Epsilon, and suggests the simulation chamber at the Red Base. The Reds are busy being idiots, and Donut's return ruined their hopes of rescue mission. Caboose easily sneaks past Griff and takes Epsilon with him. The unit isn't stable, but while within the room, Epsilon's system is able to communicate using the holographic tech. And once again, I have to remark on this series analogy to DID, because Epsilon as a gatekeeper type is responsible for the memories of Alpha and his trauma. In this case, he's able to remember the fragments that were taken away from him as well. Each of these fragments takes on their own personality within Epsilon, and a version of Delta appears to speak with Caboose, fronting, in a sense. He tells Caboose that the place where Donut came from and where Tucker is presently seems to possess a source of great power, and he encourages Caboose to go there. Delta tells him that he'll explain more when he's able to. When the Reds find Caboose, he tells them where he's going. Griff goes with him to protect his plans of never having to actually fight for the Red Army, and Sarge goes with him. Simmons and Donut are left behind with Lopez with nothing to do while the others leave for the desert. Guys, I really appreciate it. Are we there yet? Shut, Shut up. up! Good luck! Acaban de conducir en el agua. Eventually, we do get to the desert. A group of mercenaries, led by a guy called CT, are attempting to pilfer an alien temple for its tech. There's immediately something sketchy about this guy, and all of the radios at the dig site are either busted or missing. They're completely isolated. And then the temple doors open. Tucker comes to the rescue as a fight ensues, and the four of them then hole up inside of the temple. Tucker tells them that he and Junior have been working as ambassadors between the aliens and humans since they parted ways. And wildly, it seems like the two have a pretty decent parent-child relationship. But that's really not the thing to be concerned about right now, since the mercs that are trying to break in have already killed the soldiers who were stationed here and taken over the site. Tucker has been left to guard the temple and its artifacts all this time, and tells them not to touch anything. Naturally, Caboose wanders off. This is where Delta told him that he could find the energy source that would bring Epsilon back online. And then he finds it. Hold still! I am holding still! You're the one that's moving! Yeah, that sounds like- Your hands on me! Fucking dude! I'm sorry, Church! Church?! <laughs> I can't explain. Who the fuck are these guys? Epsilon is unable to fully access his memories at this point, still recovering from the trauma that he experienced during Washington's implantation and now from his programming being placed into this monitor. His most recent memories are based on the stories that Caboose has been telling him, so obviously there's some work that needs to be done to bring him up to speed. But I think it's really fascinating how almost instantly Epsilon is treated more or less the same by his teammates as Alpha Church. Their personalities are very similar, as to be expected, 
and when Griff, Sarge, and Tucker's conversation devolves into bickering, he attempts to mediate. It doesn't exactly work because he has very little control over this new body, but that doesn't stop him from trying to be in charge. And then he's actually put in charge when the alien mercs recognize the artifact that he's in and worship him as an idol. CT orders his men to apprehend Church, but the aliens turn on them when they shoot the relic. CT grabs him and runs. There's a chase to stop him, with Tucker managing to cut him off. Blowing up his vehicle doesn't kill him, and CT manages to corner Tucker at the top of the ruins. So tell me one thing though, who are you really? And who's seeing you here? Sorry, you'll never know. Hey, what's up? What in the hell is that thing? Oh, son of a... I am not a thing! My name is Leonard Church! AND YOU WILL FEAR MY LASER FACE! CT's gone now, but... <laughs> uh, the aliens are pretty attached to Church now. Back at Valhalla, Simmons almost immediately decided that he would try to blow up the blue base. Probably in some attempt to seek catharsis due to his unresolved paternal figure issues that are causing him to act out against Sarge, who at this point is the closest thing he's ever had to a stable father figure. It's not exactly going well. Lopez might not care for Sarge, but he's disinterested in aiding Simmons on his new vendetta and when he's repeatedly insulted, Lopez fully refuses to help. That is, until Donut reveals that Caboose still has the Epsilon unit. Suddenly feeling his sense of duty again, Simmons decides that he needs to follow after them to retrieve the unit and turn it into command. Lopez is fine with helping them leave, and puts together a couple ATVs so that they'll leave him in peace. Simmons goes to get Donut, and... Guess what? Blue Team got a new soldier! What? They sent another team member! Why would they do that? That doesn't make any sense. Oh, fuck! Welcome to the neighborhood, see you later! Agent Main begins his assault on the outpost and blows up the vehicles that Lopez just finished building. The three of them manage to find Main's jeep with the starter pulled. When it looks like all is lost, Washington arrives. Initially, it seems as though he's going to engage Main, but the situation escalates when Washington shoots Lopez, and then Donut. Wash isn't here to help them. He's made a deal with the subcommittee chairman to deliver the Epsilon unit in exchange for a clean slate and his freedom. Yes. I'm listening. Agent Washington, when you find these blue soldiers that you're talking about, what makes you think that they are just going to give you the Epsilon yep. unit when you ask them for it? <laughs> for as long as I can remember, I've been lied to, taken advantage of, shot in the back, and left for dead. And now, I have a way out of all of this. What in the hell makes you think that I'm going to ask for it? Every single reveal in this show is so damn satisfying, and Washington's face he'll turn at the end of this season is one of my favorite twists in the whole series, mostly because it makes perfect sense for his character. After everything that's happened, he just wants a shot at moving forward, and he's willing to do whatever it takes to make that happen. It doesn't matter that these were his allies before, they're nothing more than obstacles interfering with his mission now. He's such an asshole, but his motivations are completely understandable. The character development in this season in general is so good getting to see Griff get off his ass and actually want to work towards something, while Simmons' bitterness is allowed to some time to simmer really helps ensure that they don't remain static characters. Caboose's mission of bringing back his best friend is kinda heartbreaking in a way, because for the longest time he's just been the village idiot in the comic relief, and in this season we get to see the spark of brilliance that exists within him. Even Tucker has become a far more competent character, but they're all still our same reds and blues, and now with Washington we get to watch his messy journey of self-discovery. Caboose might be my favorite member of the cast, but Wash is the one that I most look forward to watching with each repeat viewing. After shooting Donut, Wash and Maine get Simmons to send out a call for a medic. Doc is the one who responds. Simmons seems briefly guilty that he's gotten him involved, but Washington needs someone who can run a scan on Maine. His armor is still rigged with all of the equipment that he stole from Project Freelancer, and the power draw is straining him now that he's lost the fragments. We'll learn more about him later, but Maine is such a tragic figure in this story. The meta's manipulations have left him as a broken shell of a man, not much more than the chairman's guard dog. Doc does what he can, but it's not much. And then Sarge radios the base. Back in the desert, the aliens have begun worshipping Church. So far, the distraction has kept his allies safe, but he's starting to get visions of someone in black armor, and he gets so fixated that he wanders away after her while the aliens are expecting him to preach. His vision shifts to a waterfall the description lining up with that of Valhalla. Sarge decides that there might be something to these visions given the power that Epsilon has locked since he's been in the relic, so he sticks him on the jeep's radio antenna to boost the signal. Simmons sounded good. I guess he's got everything under control. Donut and Lopez are dead and someone is taking Simmons prisoner. 
What? Everything sounded fine to me. Think about it. How do you answer the radio at our base? Thank you for calling Red Base. This is Private Griff. I'm assist you today. And we've drilled that since day one. Simmons answered hi. That was my first clue. So maybe he's just He a... also said the radio was in disrepair. When has Lopez ever let something go without the proper maintenance? Never. And look at the time. Can't. Clock's broken. It's 1730. And everybody knows that 1730 is... Donuts Daily Wine and Cheese Hour. I didn't hear any tinkling glasses. Did you? You're right. He also mentioned that the weather was rainier. And as we all know, Mount Rainier is the biggest landmass in the state of... Washington. We do? Uh, I mean, we do. How many Washingtons do we know? Did he mean Agent Washington? And who's the biggest mass we know associated with Washington? The Meta. So the Meta and Washington have teamed up to kill Donut and Lopez, and now they're holding Simmons and Doc prisoner. We have to help him. Wait, Doc? How, how do you know he's there? Please, Griff, it's so obvious. I don't want to insult your intelligence by explaining every little detail. Sergeant Griff head off to Valhalla, and Epsilon follows along behind them. Sarge has a plan on how to deal with Agent Washington when they get to their base. And I really just have to let this first bit play out fully. Shotgun, damn it! Oh, yeah, shotgun. That's what you. What? Wait. What are you up to? What is that noise? Do I hear a... Car? How's my bumper face, asshole? Uh Uh-oh. This is everything. Thanks to a partnership between Rooster Teeth and a young man named Monty Ohm, the future of Red vs. Blue suddenly became much more than the sum of its parts. The series was no longer limited by the medium that it started in, and by this point the story had grown so great that it needed something like this to be able to amp up the stakes. They had done everything that they could with Machinima, and now they were given the gift of an extraordinarily talented animator. Monty's work on the series continues through season 10, and every single scene is a feast for the eyes, filled with wonderful details and dynamic camera movements. Remember that Wash and Meta fight from Season 6? So much of the action came not from the character models themselves, but the dynamism of the way that they used their camera. There's also a lot of interaction with the actual environment around these characters. The breaking of the wall, throwing Wash into a stack of crates that he has to stumble out of, the warthog getting flung into a massive rock so that it blows up. It all feels so epic, and it's so damn satisfying to get to see how actually capable these idiots are, even if they still don't come close to the levels of the Meta and the other freelancers. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Epsilon followed the Reds back to Valhalla to chase after his vision, and Maine recognizes him almost immediately. He lures him away so that the Reds can make a break for it, stopping at Blue Base to investigate, but he doesn't find anything. Epsilon goes to catch up with the Reds, and they're not especially thrilled that he's led the meta in their direction. In a stroke of brilliance, Griff starts to antagonize Epsilon to try and turn his laser on. They piss him off, but it's not enough. Until... Uh Uh-oh, look out! It's the big guy! And there's... Get them, meta! Get them! WASHINGTON! The sight of Washington triggers Epsilon in a very literal sense. Their last experience with each other ended poorly, and Epsilon no doubt associates him with the trauma that he inherited from the Alpha AI. Lashing out like that has drained him of his energy, and the Reds take him with them when they head back to the desert. Tucker and Caboose are still dealing with the pissed off aliens when they get back, and Caboose tries to convince them that the Reds took their relic. Which they only kinda did, but Sarge doesn't want the aliens to see that Epsilon is powered down. Griff kicks the artifact into a minefield, and Simmons is nearly blown up when he goes to get it. The intensity of recent events has caused Epsilon to become unstable. Delta fronts for the system to explain that seeing Washington triggered some of the traumatic memories that Epsilon holds, and he's coping poorly with them. Once again, the analog to DID is really well written. The point of a DID system is to provide the individual protection from trauma, with alters existing so that the body and host can function. It isn't until something happens to bring attention to the alter's presence that the walls between these parts of the system begin to weaken. Delta doesn't believe that Epsilon is aware of him or the other fragments in their system yet, but it's only a matter of time. Delta fears that he'll begin the cycle again, though we don't yet know what this is in reference to. Church wakes up with no memory of what happened and takes Caboose aside. Guys, do you ever notice Blue Team has, like, a lot more stuff going on than us? Yeah. 
boring stuff. Church asks Caboose if he's good with electronics, and with the assumed answer being yes, Church takes the both of them to a freelancer facility. The Reds follow after them in their jeep, and Tucker makes a break for it from the aliens on foot. Back at Valhalla, Doc got punched into the wall during the fight between Maine and the Reds. Wash's efforts to try and pull him out aren't going very well. Doc unfortunately doesn't know much about what they're after, but he does remember the distress call that Tucker had sent out to command, and that it mentioned sand. By the time that they make it back to the temple, the reds and blues are long gone, but they manage to blow Doc out of the wall with grenades. With no clues left behind, Wash tries to get answers from aliens. This also doesn't go well. Washington kills the aliens one by one to try and force them to help him, but he winds up killing all of them instead. Doc manages to stay alive, and Maine finds the memory unit that Epsilon was housed in, now empty and damaged. Washington modifies the unit so that they can capture the fragment when they find it. Their goal now is to try and track him down. Epsilon takes Caboose to a freelancer storage facility. The AI in charge, Phyllis, recognizes Epsilon as the project director and allows the two of them access. She introduces them to the bunker intended as a failsafe. It's filled with databases and equipment for the program and their simulation outposts. There's also a wing of the facility that only the director has access to. Epsilon tells Phyllis to open the door. Inside is a horde of bodies meant as backups for the Alpha to be stored in, but Epsilon's only focused on one thing. It doesn't take long for the Reds to catch up and bust their way into the facility. They find Caboose just outside of this wing. I'm just going to walk over this way now. Agent Texas returns and we get another Montium fight sequence. If I could have my way, I'd go ahead and play out the entire fight for you, but this video is long enough, so the link should be up there in the card if you'd like to go watch and come back. Like every other fight that he's the lead animator on, Monty had such a wonderful grasp on the way that people move, and he used that knowledge to exaggerate the choreography. His fights feel like watching intricate dance moves, and every hit has so much impact. The way that the environment gets used here, with all of the shipping containers and the old freelancer tech, makes for such a dynamic fight as the camera pulls you up close and personal so that you can feel the impact of each punch. There's so much about a good action sequence that can just suck you in. It's not even about the violence, but the artistry behind it. That probably sounds pretentious, but just saying it fucking rips isn't enough for how much fun I have with the show. And I've already spent like an hour and a half or so doing my best to sum up this series that defies explanation, so fuck it. This shit's awesome and I love it. you pick on somebody your own size. What? Stop it! Tess, you are embarrassing me! Ow! Stop! Caboose helps to incapacitate Tex by locking down everyone on the training floor's armor. This puts Church into recovery mode, but thankfully he's still in the facility, narrowly avoiding setting off a beacon that Washington could use to track him down. He gets unlocked, as do the rest of the guys, before going ghost to meet Tex inside of her frame. This isn't the same Texas that we knew before. This is an Echo. She doesn't know these guys, and the most recent memories that she has from her previous iteration were trying to escape from a freelancer facility. And now that she's here, she has questions. She knows something about her doesn't make sense. There's a gap in her self-continuity. As much as she cares for him, being Church's girlfriend is definitely not enough. Her mission becomes a hunt for answers about who she is, though she already has a grasp on how she was made. There's a running theme throughout this series about identity, and the struggles that we go through as we try to figure out who we are in relation to those around us, and those who've shaped us into the people that we are now. Epsilon is only mostly aware of who he is. The audience knows without a doubt that the Alpha was a copy of the freelancer director. Despite possessing those memories, there is still a difference in experience that sees Epsilon being defined by the trauma that he experienced. He doesn't recognize himself as being a direct relation of the director, and instead he's found himself with a great deal more in common with the Reds and Blues idea of who he is. Epsilon is functionally a new church, and church's life, though hectic, was better than that which bore Epsilon into this world. He's begun to identify with the version of himself that he never got to be, rather than his trauma and his abuser. Our new text is similarly torn, but she lacks any significant connection to these new people in her life. She doesn't even understand her own motivations, and she needs to know more. 
Text and Church begin to go through the old freelancer files. There's documentation on all of the agents, except for Texas and the director. It's not quite a dead end, however. There's record of a safe house not too far from the bunker that they're currently in. Tex goes to search for weapons and a new set of armor, while Phyllis asks Church if he would like to make a new journal entry, as it's been some time since the director last recorded one. As he asks her to play back an older entry, it becomes even clearer who our old Texas was. The counselor's insistence on referring to Agent Texas as a byproduct continues to frustrate me. We have seen our share of unharvestable fragments. She is certainly not one of them. No, indeed. She's something else entirely. Tex returns with her new gear, and then the two leave for the safe house. It doesn't take much for Tex to get past the few guards who are still stationed here. Epsilon is beginning to remember this place, though he doesn't understand why. Tex explains that this is where she staged the break-in to free the Alpha from the Project's torment. But she failed to save him. And with the safe house a dead end, she believes that she needs to find the director in order to get the answers that she wants. And there are two people left out there who might be able to help her find him. Agents Washington and Maine. And if they can't take her to him, then she'll kill them and tear apart everything that the director built. Everything that he built for her. This feels like her last straw, raging against the machine that she's been forced to be connected to. So she shoots Church to activate the recovery beacon. Back in the bunker, Simmons is going through the stored files and finds the freelancer records about the red and blue simulation bases. They take some time to go through the information within, and the full realization of their role within the military becomes clear. These bases are staffed by low-level enlistees with poor testing scores and field skills, and are designed as training grounds for freelancer agents. Griff and Simmons aren't especially shaken by this news, more offended by it than anything else. But the revelation is wholly life-shattering for Sarge. His whole identity has been hinging on the idea that he's a valuable member of the military. This reality check is what causes him to be the first to volunteer when the bunker alerts Caboose of the recovery beacon, and he asks for help saving Church. Let me ask you two a question. You ever wonder why we're here? Um, it does seem to be one of life's great mysteries. No, I mean you! What are you doing here? Maybe you're here because you don't have anywhere else to go. Maybe you're all here because deep down, you want to be here. The reason doesn't matter. What matters is that you're here. For all we know, Texas and Church are dead. That means we're the only ones who know what's happened. The only ones who can prevent them from covering it up. So I'm not ordering you to go. I ain't even asking. You do what you gotta do, Private Griff. <sighs> I'll go get my car keys. After spending the last seven seasons being the most static and uncomplicated character of the series, Sarge delivers a motivational speech that rallies the guys into joining Caboose on his rescue mission. Washington, Maine, and Doc all respond to the beacon first. Another fight sequence ensues, and Texas thoroughly thrashes her opponents. She has the upper hand during the entire fight, having rigged the mountainside and cliff with explosives. A lucky shot knocks her down as Wash and Maine are about to fall into the ocean below. Maine takes advantage of her weakened state and uses the damage capture unit on her. For a moment, it feels as though Wash has everything that he wants. Epsilon is alone and weakened, and Texas is out of commission. But the meta has his AI now. She might not be the original, but Texas was always the strongest of the fragments, most individualistic and most capable. He doesn't need to continue following orders anymore. Nothing that he was promised could compare to this. So he turns. Wash still needs Epsilon, but he can't let Megan get away. Unfortunately, Maine is far stronger, and overpowers Washington almost immediately. I knew you would do this, Meta. I just can't believe... Can't believe... I can't believe it. There you are! Land right next to him! Right. Land. You do know how to land this vehicle, don't you? Sure, that just means stop flying, right? They might not be the cavalry that he was hoping for, but the Sim Troopers come to the rescue. If you can consider crashing a pelican to be a rescue. With Maine theoretically taken out, the guys regroup around the capture unit. It's damaged and rigged to only be one way. Tex is trapped inside, unless Wash can get it to a lab. He agrees to let her out on the condition that Epsilon joins him willingly. Because she's the only thing that truly really matters to him, Church agrees. But the unit needs help. Wash sends off the reds and blues to find equipment that he can use to stabilize it. Epsilon insists that he can go into the unit and get her back out. Wash refuses, not about to compromise his last chance at freedom. But Epsilon has started to remember. 
She was someone important to the director. Her name was Allison. She died, and because of that, Epsilon believes that she's doomed to fail, no matter how strong she is, because her death was ultimately all that the director was able to remember of her. Wash is able to sympathize. He gets knocked out of the fight early on, blown up by a grenade launcher. The Reds and Tucker join in on the fight while Caboose stays behind the church. It's a lot of fun to see these idiots in action. The military might have only ever considered them cannon fodder, but they're able to hold their own against Freelancer's best agents. Even though she kicked their asses, they stayed up in the fight with Texas for several minutes, and now that they're up against one of the nastiest baddies they've ever faced, we get to see them work together to really triumph. Griff uses his weight to his advantage to grapple Maine, Tucker lands a solid hit against him with his sword going clean through his armor, and Sarge is actually kinda clever. He puts himself on the front line of the fight and gets Maine to focus on him so that Griff and Simmons can put together the rest of his plan. Ah! Hey Griff! I've lost my shotgun! What am I gonna do without my shotgun? Shotgun, damn it! Shotgun? Come on, Simmons. Ah. Ah. Hey, Meta! Settle a bet, would ya? Does that thing kinda look like a big cat to you? Come on, boys, Griff goes over the edge, but he catches himself on the brute shot. He gets pulled up while Epsilon is trying to get someone to help him into the memory unit. Though he's had a knack for killing Church in the past, Caboose really doesn't want to lose his best friend again. Not after he finally got him back. Epsilon resolves to doing it himself. But what if you don't come out again? Well, you know what Delta always said, right? Memory is the key. If I don't come back, then you're in charge of remembering me, okay? Don't let Tucker help. He'll just fuck it up. Bye, buddy. The unit loses power. Epsilon gets trapped inside, and without him, Wash is left without that key to his freedom. Despite everything that's happened with his betrayal, Caboose makes good on that offer to let him join him at Blue Base. Wash swaps armor with Epsilon and is given a new chance at life. It's not exactly what he was hoping for, but there's freedom in leaving the past behind and learning how to move forward. Epsilon is also busy trying to find himself. Or a piece of him, at least. Tex is in there somewhere. He just has to find her. And I mean hell. If you have to live the rest of your life in a memory, you might as well make it a good one. The process of trying to find Tex takes a while, and a lot of trial and error. While he's inside the memory unit, Epsilon runs a number of simulations trying to recreate the events that initially brought Alpha's Tex to Blood Gulch. Like you might expect from a computer program, Epsilon is going through each simulation recursively, taking what works and then reiterating the formula based on what parts of the function bring him closer to the solution that he's after. In this version that he's landed in, Tucker and Caboose are pretty close to their real-life counterparts. While over at the Red Base, nearly everyone's personalities have been flipped to the extremes. Donut is macho and abrasive, leading the team while Sarge and Simmons follow his lead, while Griff has been stuck with a terrible case of perfectionist germophobia and a touch of clinical OCD. Epsilon heads over to their base to try and convince these iterations to behave as he expects them to. It doesn't work especially well. Epsilon gets shot in the foot by Donut and he has to limp back to his base. Tucker and Caboose have already called command, however, believing that because he'd gone over to Red Base that they would have killed him. Texas is on her way, but Epsilon still hasn't figured out what it'll mean for them when he finally finds her. What happens inside of the memory unit doesn't have much consequence. The Reds are up to some shenanigans, and they do manage to get their personality sorted out. Epsilon's Texas arrives at the outpost, but because Church didn't actually die, the Blues have to make up reasons for her to stay while Epsilon figures out what he's meant to do. It takes some time, and a couple conversations. Texas is still frustrated that she's been brought back from the dead against her will, even if it wasn't really Epsilon's fault for excising her from the system, since it was Alpha that created her and the director before him whose obsession led them all down this path. It's as they're talking that Epsilon realizes that what Texas wants is freedom, to be treated like what she wants matters. It's with this realization that he finally figures it out, and just in time. 
The memory unit is close to dying, and the simulation is getting more and more unstable. Epsilon stays behind as his friends drive off towards whatever safety might be offered to them elsewhere. Texas chooses to stay with him as they wait for the end of the world. There's something I need to tell you. I think it's important that I say this. Wait a second. Look, I, I can take the whole at peace with the world thing, and I can even stomach all the accept your fate stuff, but just do me a favor, okay? Don't say goodbye. I hate goodbyes. I mean, we are space warriors, right? We should try to maintain some level of credibility. No, 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 Tex, no. I think I just figured out what the director couldn't. An alpha either. It was you, Tex. All along. See, I thought... I thought we made you. The director and the fragments. But that's not the case. You made us. When the alpha was created, you just kind of came along for the ride. You gave the director the idea that he could make something more. That he could split the Alpha up. Don't you get it? You were the memory. You were the key. You were so strong. You made a whole other person. God. He always wanted to find you. You know, to get you right. To just see you one last time. And he wanted me to be able to do the same. To find you in here or... To find you in here or just go down another iteration. Figure out this little text problem. Figure out how to do it right. But now I know. I know how to fix all of this. How to end it once and for all. It was so simple all along. I just had to tell you three words. Three words I wasn't capable of telling you before. Oh, okay, wait a minute. Are you going to say I love you? No, Tex. No. I'm not going to say I love you. I'm going to say I forget you. I forget you. I'm letting you go. Epsilon does what his previous selves never could, and he finally makes peace with the trauma of grief that he inherited from his previous iterations. With the words, I forget you. Epsilon isn't literally forgetting her. She'll always be a part of him because that's what people become when we love them. They take up space in your heart and mind as memories, and when they die, we mourn not only the loss of them, but the loss of the potential memories that we could have made together, and the person that we could have been with them. Instead, Epsilon is choosing to forget the pain. He's letting himself move forward. I lost a dear friend at the end of 2020, not to the pandemic, but to their heart condition. Grief is a tricky thing. They've been gone for two years, but it feels like they were just there, sending me good mornings in my Discord DMs. The last interaction that we had will probably always be my biggest regret. They dropped their phone and accidentally tried to start a voice call. I was frozen with anxiety when the alert went off and I didn't pick it up. I've always had issues with phones, even for people that I know. The last thing that they sent me was a brief apology for the missed call. I never could have known that that would be the last night we spoke. And I wish that I'd picked it up, that I'd gotten to hear their voice one last time, gotten to let out loud, I love you, be the last words that we got to say to each other. But I didn't get that chance. And life just sucks like that sometimes. But the important part about grief is that we get to decide how we remember them. There is nothing that can take that away from us. We can choose to remember the love and the laughs and the moments that make you feel warm inside. We don't truly forget them even as time goes on. But we can move forward from the pain that losing them causes. We remember the past and know that it's okay that we won't have a future, because nothing can take away the love that remains. As Epsilon watches the world around him fall apart, he braces for the end, knowing that he's doing the right thing and allowing himself and Texas this peace. And then Caboose appears in the sky with Sarge. The world isn't ending. He's finally being rescued. Epsilon's... Well, he's not especially happy about this, and he even insists that he gets put back into the unit to die with his newfound closure. She said we need you! She was the one who knew how 
trying to get you out. She? Who, who are you talking about? Tex? The real Tex? Tex? No, no, not Tex. The new lady. New lady? Hey there, Alpha. Been looking for you for a long time. Oh, no. Now that I've found you, you're gonna help me do what I should have done years ago. You're gonna help me kill the director. Before our Reds and Blues, there was Project Freelancer, a specialist team operating with special permissions from the UNSC. Throughout these sequences, we're not only treated to Montiome's excellent animation, but we finally learn more about the agents and what their time with the project was like. And in particular, the story of Carolina. Carolina is introduced to the series as freelancer agents North and South Dakota are waiting for extraction after their stealth mission was compromised by South's cockiness. And if Carolina's fighting skills weren't impressive enough, her musical theme is just as badass. The lyrics are in Italian and essentially call her a warrior of death. This is not just her identity within the soundtrack, but how she's defined within the project as well. She's the top agent, a competent fighter and a confident leader as well, and she takes charge as North is injured in the fighting, and makes sure that the Dakotas can get onto the extraction shuttle. Unfortunately, they're still being pursued by the Rebels, whose base they just blew up. Carolina clears North for equipment usage as South is knocked around their shuttle, and for the first time in the series, we see an unhelmeted face as North uses his bubble shield to protect the shuttle from the incoming missiles. The project's mobile headquarters, a massive ship called the Mother of Invention, arrives to retrieve them. And I just have to briefly gush over the sound design in this scene, because I always manage to get goosebumps when it comes out of hiding from behind the clouds that it's dwarfing, its presence announced with this bassy rumble that you feel more than you hear, all while the orchestra and chorus conclude the track. I love it so much. I want to buy a drink for whoever mixed this scene. During the mission debrief, the leaderboard is adjusted swapping the positions of North and South for her compromising the situation. South doesn't take this well. Think I should talk to her? Maybe we give her a minute. And it's important to note that the leaderboard becomes an ever-present set piece throughout these sequences. Whenever the director is speaking to his agents or they're in training, the leaderboard is constantly reminding them of their place within the program. They're all meant to be a team, but they're also competing against one another. This becomes a major point of contention as those in the top 10 are held to a particular standard in comparison to the rest of the program's agents. This is made especially clear as we watch a younger Agent Washington speaking with Agent Connecticut, known as CT. Getting onto the leaderboard wasn't easy for either of them, but Wash has managed to squeeze his way into the top 5. CT can see that the project is forcing competition onto the agents in order to masquerade their shady behavior. If they're focused on rising through the ranks, then they'll do whatever it takes to do so and turn a blind eye to the machinations of their superiors. Washington shows a naivety to CT's assertions here that I find really compelling, because I think that what it actually is, is denial. Wash is compassionate to a fault. In the series' extended lore, it's revealed that when he was in the military, he was court-martialed for injuring his commanding officer in order to save a platoon of soldiers from being sent to their deaths. He joined Project Freelancer because his home system was destroyed in the war, and now that the military doesn't want him, he has nowhere else to go. And he's made it work for him. Every time that we see the board, Wash is in the top 10. And he did have to work his way up to that level, but he debates with himself over whether or not CT is right. On the flip side of this, we have Carolina. In the beginning, we see her name positioned firmly at the top of the leaderboard. She's naturally competitive, and when she's at the top, she retains her confidence and stays rational for her missions. But all that changes when Agent Texas arrives on the training room floor. Texas is immediately a force to be reckoned with. On her first day with the program, she entered a training match against Wyoming, Maine, and York. She handles all three of them with ease in every single match that they fight. Carolina is immediately defensive and becomes hostile as she watches from the viewing room, and South taunts her fear that she'll be surpassed on the leaderboard. As we're watching Texas in this fight, we also learn more about Agent York in particular. While Wyoming and Maine rush into the fight, York attempts to make a plan and be more calculated in his actions. It doesn't help him against Texas, given her skills are inherently better than his, but we can see that along with his methodicalness, he's also more compassionate than his teammates. In their last round, Wyoming and Maine grow tired of losing and ditch their weapons, swapping in live ammo and real grenades. York recognizes this, and instead of joining them, his instinct is to help keep Texas safe instead. 
She chastises him for abandoning his team, but she saves him from the grenade main throws by activating his armor lock. It saves his life, but York does wind up losing his left eye in the process. It's at this point that he gains a respect for Tex, and though she initially scolded him, Texas also shares in that. Though she saved her friend, Carolina still doesn't trust Texas. But for now, she's still number one. Their next mission sees them fighting against more insurrectionists in a city. The team is tasked with recovering an alien artifact known as the Sarcophagus, and a code that will unlock it. The artifact is being held within a heavily guarded building, and the code will be held by an insurrectionist leader. They'll go in two teams. Carolina is leading Maine, Washington, and a very eager to get back to work York to make up Team 1. Team 2 sees North as leader to Wyoming and CT to act as recon to clear a path to the building, before disengaging to pursue the leader. South is deliberately left behind as punishment for her previous failure. Already, we can see the resentment building in her towards her fellow teammates. Carolina's team find their target inside of a personal collection inside the building. It's here that we see Maine's acquisition of his signature weapon, and a bit of Carolina's cocksureness leading her to disregard the feelings of her teammates. Despite his protestations that the fall is too high, Carolina kicks Maine off the side of the building to be used as a counterbalance in order to get their primary target to the roof. He makes it down fine, and acts as an effective distraction to the soldiers below, while Carolina and Wash's exit gets blocked off. Carolina goes out of her way to take out a single enemy in a way that shows off her skills. It's also worth noting that while Washington is a competent fighter, he has a tendency to make quips and remarks about their enemies and actions taken during a fight. It's very similar in tone to that of the Reds and Blues, though I doubt he'd appreciate the comparison. What the hell? It bounces? Who designed a gun that bounces? This is the worst gun ever. Of all time. It's such a stark contrast to the way that he was introduced as a jaded, ruthless soldier, and it really makes it hit hard just how traumatic his implantation of Epsilon must have been. With their enemies out of the way, Carolina and Wash regroup with York to head up to the roof. When they get there, Texas is already at the package and setting up charges to cover their tracks. We hear in the soundtrack a battle of themes, with Texas' guitar strum mixed against Carolina's motif. The tower gets blown up, and 479er arrives to secure the package. York and Carolina miss their chance at a ride back, but they go on towards securing the second objective, with Maine catching them at the last second. Tex leaves Wash behind with the sarcophagus as Carolina makes contact with her team too. North's team is pinned down and Wyoming is injured. Texas gets a ride to catch up to Carolina's team while Maine secures the codes. Carolina gets intercepted by a group of insurrectionists and another fight ensues as the briefcase is compromised. During the fight, Maine takes a bullet meant for Carolina and is later shot in the throat. Seeing Maine in these flashbacks really adds a lot to the character that we met in the previous seasons. He's never given a chance to say much, as he was a strong and silent character even before his injury, but we can see the way that he cares about his teammates and his dedication to the project. In the chaos of the fight, Tex arrives just in the nick of time to secure the codes. This pisses off Carolina royally, and this is where their rivalry truly begins. Carolina is the leader on this mission, so for anyone else, especially Texas, to take control of her objective is an affront to her. Not just her authority, but her identity as the most capable agent in the program. So she abandons her partner in order to chase after Texas. It doesn't matter to her that they're on the same side. Due to how competitive she is, anyone else is an antagonist if she isn't getting her way. It's her biggest character flaw, in the sense that she has toxic character traits that get the better of her. It makes her wonderfully written and incredibly performed. I haven't spoken much about the voice acting for any of the characters, but for Carolina, Jen Brown brings such an aggressive vulnerability to the character that she just wouldn't be the same if the performance was any different. Texas tells Carolina to fall back, and as you would expect, she doesn't. Carolina advances past her, pushing herself to her maximum limits as she chases the insurrectionist with the codes across the city. She flings herself off of bridges and between skyscrapers until she tackles him to the asphalt and is nearly hit by a truck. All the while, her theme is playing, growing more and more epic as though to reach a triumphant climax. But then it fades as she crumples to the ground. Command, the package is secure. Heading home. Excellent work, Agent Texas. Thank you, sir. Better luck next time, Carolina.
With the artifact that they acquired, the director gets to work. Our next scene is of Delta, the original, on the day that he was created. Delta, this is the director. He is going to take good care of you. I am glad to hear that. I am very confused. Don't worry, Delta. That will not last long. And when you feel better, we are going to do incredible things together, you and I. Incredible things. The leaderboard looms in the aftermath of the mission, as York and North discuss their place within the project. Both have had their names rearranged, with York now third behind Carolina, and North placed below Washington. They remark on the change in atmosphere ever since Texas arrived, and the differences in the enemies that they've been fighting against. York is wondering if they're still fighting for the side of good, and while North assures him that, of course they are, neither of them are convinced anymore. Our next phase is ready to begin, Carolina. We will be asking you to do a great many things. I'm ready, sir. Some of these things might be questionable. I'll do whatever it takes. You've given me everything. I would do anything for you. The next steps in the program's advances see the introduction of the agent's AI implantations. York is one of the first, given Delta to assist with his lockpicking, and though their personalities seem at odds with each other, they're actually quite complementary. Delta is the logic, and prone to pointing out fallacies in York's flaws. But this part of his nature doesn't stop him from making sarcastic remarks. During their first mission as partners, Delta attempts to connect with the guard that he's distracting, and unintentionally sasses York that he's been correcting his mistakes. The team is on another mission against an insurrectionist cell, finding their ship hiding in a scrapyard. Washington attempts to connect with Carolina by asking if she's okay after having given up the AI that was assigned to her, but she insists that she's okay. The fight sequence against the insurrectionists is fantastic, with Washington at one point disabling the gravity. Carolina is a badass, absolutely obliterating her enemies with her grab hammer and not hindered at all by the lack of gravity. When it comes back online, she lands in the same pose that Tex had during her first fight in Season 8. Carolina gives her team their orders, and only then realizes that CT is missing. We've seen her acting suspiciously before this, but it's clear now that she switched sides. Back with Carolina, the leader that they're after has gotten away and is now deeper within the scrapyard. York finally catches up to the team after having been sucked out into space just as they're heading out. Though, Wash is still paranoid about using his jetpack. Where are they off to in such a hurry? They found the leader. He's hiding out in Bone Valley. We're going all the way over there? After what happened to Georgia? Would someone please tell me what happened to Georgia? Dude, you do not want to know. I really do, though! They head out, and things are quiet. The fighter ships have all left, and any remnants of their enemy appear to have been driven off. And then from the wreckage comes the leadership, the staff of Karan. The enemy ship fires on the Mother of Invention, and it's at this point that the agents realize the insurrectionists left a nuke behind. Carolina drags Wash back onto the ship, and the team escapes the blast. Everyone but CT. I expected it to be... bigger. Why? You've seen mine. It's small too. Yeah, but he's green. How does that even make sense? Hey, Wash. Quit staring. You're making it nervous. Yeah, it's just... They're so small. Small, yeah. But you wouldn't believe what it can do. Besides, you better get used to it. You're gonna have one of your own soon enough. Ugh, give me a break. It's all right, Theta. Come on out. People just want to say hello to you. I don't know. There's so many of them. And they're so... big. You see? I'm not the only one who thinks size is important. I'm just gonna let that one go. It's okay, Theta. They're all friends of mine for reasons beyond my comprehension. The second fragment that we're introduced to is Theta. He's nervous around others and the embodiment of the Alpha's innocence and an analog to a little altar. He's been paired with North for his caring nature and ability to give him encouragement to reach his full potential. We get to see their dynamic in action and I really love how North's abilities and equipment match his personality type. He's naturally protective from growing up caring for South, and his bubble shield reflects this. He also uses a sniper rifle, which allows him to both keep an eye on his teammates as well as keep them safe from enemies that they might not see. In the subsequent scene, we see the agents attending a lecture on AI theory, and we get to see the emotional core fragments who've been assigned. 
South is bitter that she has to be present when she hasn't received an AI of her own, and resents Carolina for giving hers away. Carolina did this for selfless reasons. Giving Maine a voice since being shot in the throat took away what little he had to say for himself. And Sigma is immediately different from the rest of the fragments. He was the Alpha's creativity and ambition, but because of his aspirations, he has ulterior motives that the other characters overlook. He wishes to learn more about the theory of metastability, or the point at which an AI could be considered fully human. It makes a certain kind of sense that something designed around its ability to create would wish to be the same as that which created it. Ironic that this lecture is a discussion about rampancy, where the director declared the likelihood of a fragment going rogue as incredibly slim. The meta's theme plays as Sigma considers their discussion. York and North meet in the mess hall with Wash as a side character in the conversation about their fragment's obsession with the Alpha. Delta and Theta don't seem to fully understand what it is or how they're related to it, but they can't stop thinking about it. York is starting to get concerned about the situation. AIs can't be copied, so the agents have been getting pieces of one. But how is the director getting so many? To the director of Project Freelancer, Dr. Leonard Church. Dear director, allow me to introduce myself. I am a representative of the newly formed UNSC Oversight Subcommittee. Our organization is charged with the protection of high-level assets of the military, one of which recently went missing. These assets are entrusted to our programs as a privilege, not as a right. As such, they will be safeguarded with the utmost care. In these dark times, mankind has the opportunity not only to prove his humanity, but to earn it. Well, third draft this afternoon. Let's see who else is arriving. I look forward to a long and mutually beneficial relationship for our two departments. Yours truly, Malcolm Hargrove, assistant to the Oversight Subcommittee Chairperson. The team's next mission is to find CT and apprehend her equipment. Carolina is initially hesitant to pursue and likely kill a former teammate, but her place on the leaderboard and her loyalty to the director outweigh her apprehension. They've tracked the cell that CT is working with to their hideout and they fight their way inside. Wash calls in Maine, where he gets revenge on the man who shot him in the throat. We also start to see Sigma's manipulations through this, and the way that he treats Maine less as a partner, and more like a tool. They make it into the base, though their path is blocked off by a pair with miniguns. Carolina's teammates are refusing her orders to advance, when a cloaked figure runs past both them and their attackers. Carolina immediately recognizes Tex and the threat that she poses not to the team, but to her own ego and position as the director's best agent. With the aid of her speed booster, she leaves her team behind to go after Texas. Carolina, damn it! Man, she really wants to win. Yep, but it's not them she's fighting against. Carolina catches up to Tex outside of the safe room. Agent Florida gets back up and takes out the miniguns for the team, allowing York and Delta to shut down the facility's power and to let them inside. CT shows herself as a decent fighter as she holds her own against both of the project's top agents, but her reliance on her special equipment isn't enough to protect her from Texas' quick thinking. Texas nearly finishes her off, but Carolina stops her and chastises her for daring to kill a teammate. I don't know what's gotten into you, Texas, but you better figure out the difference between your enemies and your friends. CT gets away, but she succumbs to her wounds shortly after. Her partner claims her armor for his own and goes to meet his own fate. The program is now under close scrutiny for the loss of military equipment, and Caroline has taken the fall for the mission's failure. York watches as she pushes herself in her individual training, supporting her from afar. He and North talk as she runs her sessions over and over and over. Theta is having difficulty settling down, and it's keeping North awake. He walks the halls like a parent driving their kid around the neighborhood to help them fall asleep. The fragments are anxious about something, though they can't figure out why. North feels obligated to try and help them. York can sympathize. That last round showed a 3.6% Just run it again! Resetting training room four. Round complete. Run 
it again. Resetting training room floor for next round. I think we all could use some rest. Caroline is overworking herself as making her vulnerable. She's convinced that she's not strong enough, and Sigma uses this as an opportunity to bend her to his desires. He tells her that Texas was given an AI, Omega, who Sigma claims is the strongest of them. He convinces her that this is the reason for Texas' position within the program, that it isn't her natural ability, but the AI that's put her at the top. Carolina confronts the director while he's on the training floor with Texas, and demands that she's given both of the new fragments that they've acquired. The director initially refuses, but she sways him with the justification being that the newer fragments are weaker than those who came before. He reminds her that she's personally responsible for putting off the timetable for her teammates, and we see in the locker room the effect that this is having on South. She's felt cheated ever since her brother received Theta, and Wash fails to reassure her with the knowledge that he's already been put back on the schedule. Have you ever notice every time you open your mouth you make things worse? Sorry. The rift that the leaderboard has already driven between the Asians is growing more and more as the rivalry between Carolina and Tex starts to affect the rest of the team. Texas is starting to recognize this. She doesn't understand Carolina's obsession, but she is realizing that she has an unwilling part in it. Before following York to the recovery room, she pockets a dog tag that she finds in her locker. As soon as she's awake from her procedure, Carolina insists on a sparring match against Texas. Now that she has her AIs, she's convinced that she'll finally be able to beat her on an even playing field. Though we see Tex telling Omega to stay out of the way. She doesn't need him to fight. The team is gathered in the observation room when the fight begins, but before the first punch is even thrown, the director sees what's happening and calls out for Allison. This triggers every fragment in the arena. All except for Texas. Those in the observation room are able to recover quickly enough, but Carolina is left on the training room floor, screaming in agony as her fragments are sent into a spiral. Her theme plays out as a haunting lullaby, as Tex realizes that help isn't coming fast enough. And in her own, strangely compassionate way, she knocks Carolina unconscious with a punch. Sorry kid, this is for your own good. Tex comes to find Carolina still in the recovery room days later. York is by his partner's side, refusing to leave her until she wakes up. Tex and North speak, and he recognizes that her attitude is different now. They talk about their fragments, and Tex admits that she's pulled Omega and hasn't used him in days. She asks North to tell her if Carolina finally wakes up, and when she leaves, Theta remarks that he's starting to like her, even if she is still scary. Washington is still scheduled to be the next to receive an AI, despite the training room incident and the fact that Carolina still hasn't woken up. The director and counselor are at work with Alpha, now employing Sigma, Gamma, and Omega to create scenarios to further torment their originator. With Alpha having shed another part of himself, they bring in the alien artifact to stabilize it. Welcome to the world, Epsilon. Today is your birthday. As Wash goes into the operating room, Texas heads to the classrooms alone. The dog tag she found was left for her by Connie. It holds a goodbye message, where she calls her Allison, and leaves her all of the files and information that she's been digging up on the director and the project. The files detail everything about the fragments and the truth behind their creation. And then there's a file about Texas, where she learns the truth about what she is and who she was. It's with this that she has her new goal save the Alpha. And while Texas is discovering her truth, Sigma's plans are starting to come together. The Dakotas meet with Wash in the recovery room to catch him up on the events that have transpired while he's been under. Tex has gone rogue, and Carolina is refusing to give up Ada and Iota. I find it especially notable that Carolina's fragments are the embodiment of the Alpha's love and happiness. They're never given much screen time, and details about them are only hinted at while Tex is going through the files. But we can tell from the way that Carolina interacts with the people around her that love and happiness are things that she's desperate for, but has struggled to find, either through her own actions or through circumstances beyond her control. Her resistance towards giving them up feels like it goes beyond a selfish desire for power, but instead to finally have access to something in her head that's giving her what she so desperately needs as a character. Their headquarters is now under attack. York has joined Texas in her goals of protecting the fragments and rescuing the Alpha. Though the director doesn't want to hurt Texas, he tells Carolina that she knows what she needs to do. 
The project's extra forces aren't enough to stop Texas, and York takes out Wyoming and his goons with ease before catching up with her. North has sided with Texas as well, his drive to protect Theta enough to convince him to stop his sister from interfering. York takes out the Mother of Invention's controls and gravity, sending the ship flying to the planet below. Tex fights her way through the base with her allies firmly on her side while Carolina moves to stop her. York confronts her. He tries to get her to join them, and he tells her that she has nothing to prove. And then they fight. Carolina's theme plays in a heartbreaking piano, and she tosses back the lighter that she took from him on their first date as she leaves him behind. Carolina and Texas finally face off in the halls. Texas tells her that she can't win, but she can join her. Carolina refuses. The ship crashes, and she's flung out into the snow. Texas finally finds the Alpha. He's tired, delirious, and barely functioning. He doesn't know who he is or who Tex is. There's so little left of him for her to save. So instead, she says goodbye. Huh. I don't know why, but... I hate goodbyes. <sighs> Me too. Main and Sigma go after Carolina while she's downed from the crash. They take Ada and Iota from her, then throw her from the cliff. Texas realizes what he's done and runs away. Even if she can't save the Alpha, she can save Omega and herself. York gets away with Delta, and after having beat South in their fight, North picks her up and takes her away from the program, hoping that they can move on. We know how that ended. The director and the counselor realize that they're running out of time, and this is the tipping point for the program. What's left of Alpha, our original church, is sent away with Agent Florida, who's put in the position of caretaker as Captain Flowers. This series of flashbacks really alters everything that we know about the project and the freelancer characters that we'd met before. Getting to see their origins really makes a difference to the series' storytelling overall. Seeing the way that they were all manipulated by their leadership and how they were forced to compete against each other puts so many of their actions into perspective. The action sequences are flashy and entertaining, but the writing is still the heart of the show. The moments when they're just standing around and talking, the premise upon which the show was even created, does so much to add characterization for a group who were little more than strangers just a few hours ago. South's bitterness is understandable when you see what she had to deal with during her time with the project. She was stuck with her perceived inadequacies fueling her rage while her brother was the only one truly trying to lift her up. And in the end... North was such a beacon of light on the team, always striving towards the moral good, and he put so much love into Theta. In all of his appearances, Theta was this charming bundle of pure innocence, always expressing himself during idle moments while North gave him encouragement. It makes their ultimate fates, with North gone and Theta absorbed into and then killed with the meta, that much more tragic. York is a character that I'm particularly partial to. He's a really sympathetic character throughout and is honestly just a decent person. He's able to crack jokes every now and then, and he never lets his disability prevent him from being just as capable as his fellow agents. He joined the freelancers because of Carolina's entry to the program, and he cares about her despite her flaws and constantly supports her. Unfortunately, it's not enough for her. Caroline is unable to separate her worth from the opinions of the people that she views as having given her life purpose. As much as he clearly loves her, love isn't enough to make someone heal. In the end, while he's able to see past the project's corruption, she still can't. Carolina sees him siding with Texas as a rejection, the ultimate form of betrayal from one of the few people in her life that she respects and cares for. And she can't handle that. It makes his death feel so much worse once you see who he was. York dies in a mini-series that takes place between seasons 4 and 5, killed unceremoniously and left with only Delta to keep him company in his final moments. I didn't go over that series due to the number of plot holes that it pokes into Texas's motivations, and I honestly find it better to accept it as a part of the series' growing pain since so much is heavily retconned later. Carolina survived her fall, and after a number of years in hiding, she's back, and she needs help taking her revenge on the director. 
Carolina tracks down the Reds and Blues after hearing news of their attack on the Freelancer base and the defeat of the Meta. It's with her help that they save Church from the storage facility where he was taken as evidence. The people who picked him up were unaware of what they were in possession of. Because he has the director's memories, Carolina makes the assumption that she can use him to track down his current location. Unfortunately, while Church possesses a lot of memories between himself, the director, and Alpha, he doesn't necessarily have access to all of them. There's still a great deal beyond his reach. As I was going through the series to take notes, I came across someone who described Church as a Theseus' ship of a character. The original Church has been dead and gone for a while now, but thanks to Caboose and the brief connection with the Alpha, Epsilon has all the memories that he needs to be able to relate to the events his previous iteration went through. And when you are your memories, it hardly matters that Epsilon is an entirely different entity. As far as he and his friends are concerned, he is Church. All of his pieces were replaced, but he's still the same person. Church gets really annoyed to see Wash for the first time since going into the unit, and is especially pissed off when he learns that he's essentially replaced him as the blue team's leader. Caroline is disinterested in their bickering, however, and though we can tell immediately that Wash has loosened up since joining the blues, he more or less falls back in line as Caroline's subordinate. The Reds find them an escape route out of the facility, and the group heads out to retrace the meta steps. Caroline is hoping that there will be a clue out there somewhere, most likely left behind by Maine and Sigma. When they stop so that the Reds and Blues can take a break from driving, Carolina shares a bit of vulnerability with Wash. Sigma was her AI, and they were all told that they were chosen for their specific fragments. She feels as though the director must have known what would happen, with his tendency towards scheming and running informal psychological experiments on the team. A turn of phrase causes Tucker to give away that he and Church were eavesdropping. Carolina snaps at them when Church tells her that she can't expect them to keep following her when she's given them so little information about why she's dragging them around. The Reds go to Wash to tell him that they're planning on abandoning the mission in order to return to Valhalla and secure their base to make sure that nothing's gone wrong in their absence. Wash recognizes the opportunity to bluff and keeps them around by agreeing that it's a dangerous mission since they're probably wanted by the military by now. It's not a full lie, but it is enough to keep them around. The power facility winds up being a dead end, so they head out to the desert temple where they last saw CT. Carolina is keeping the boys in the dark, and they're starting to lose what little trust they had for her. Church is stuck trying to keep them united, since they can at least trust each other, even if they don't trust Carolina or Wash. They decide that they need some way to spy on her, which leads Simmons to transferring Church from Tucker's personal storage into one of the ATVs. Washington takes Carolina to where he found Connie's helmet. Carolina explains how the mission failed, but fortunately CT's partner had kept the data that she'd given him on the artifact. They get the data pad up and running, and it shows the old monitor that Caboose had put Epsilon in. Unfortunately, they left it back at the storage facility. Carolina is getting frustrated and needs to get away. About a day away is the old fortress where York was shot by Wyoming. She takes the ATV and leaves, accidentally bringing Church along with her. She tries to find some catharsis over his death, but is caught off guard by Church interrupting her. She tries intimidating him, but it doesn't work. So, she confesses why she refuses to talk to them. The people that she was closest to were given everything that they could have ever wanted, and yet they still turned on each other. Church sifts through his memories, looking for something to give her that will get her to trust him at least. And he gives her work. Delta? Delta, please, don't. Good evening, beautiful people. It's a lovely Monday night, and I'm here with another adrenaline-pumping journal entry, courtesy of our good friend Delta. It can't be. York, please. Documentation is an important yeah, part of- Yeah. Too many Christmas, forgive me for trying to lighten the mood. So today, I intercepted some interesting messages from our good friends over at Project Freelancer. It sounds like someone is causing them a bit of trouble. Old news, I know. Old news. But here's the interesting part. D, give me a drum roll, please. I would prefer not to. They said, she. She, as in a lady. Not Wyoming. Not Maine. But a former female freelancer has suddenly popped up on the PFL radar. And if you know me, then you know my money's on the gal in the greenish-blue, seafoam, green, turquoise, whatever it is, armor. Okay? Well, at least, if I had any money. Wait! Still no ID on our female troublemaker. But given what I know about South Last location, fairly certain the odds are in my favor. Again, I must point out that from a statistical standpoint, the odds of Agent Carolina... In other news, Hurricane Delta continues to rain on my parade. So when I finally see her again, I think I've narrowed down my line to like two options, okay? Here, here they are. One, hey there, Carolina. 
If I said I like your armor, would you hold it against me? Or two? York, please focus. What? Pickup lines are important. Did I ever tell you about how we met? See, I was out one night with my buddies. They abandoned me in some ridiculous nightclub. I think it's called Herrera. Herrera. So I'm just sitting there at the bar, bored out of my skull. And I'm flicking this lighter off and on. Then from out of nowhere, she walks up, she just grabs the lighter right out of my hand. And she goes, Agent Foxtrot 12, journal entry 0424. Intercepted another transmission from command today. They have confirmed that Agent Texas continues to evade their response teams. That she still does possess the Omega AI. Nothing more to report. York. You know, D, I bet if I had opened up with a pickup line, I would have never seen her again. Why is that? Because she probably would have busted my other eye. What would you have told her, York? I would have told her that I understand why she did what she did. I just wish she hadn't. I wish she could have learned to let things go. I guess I should too. Why did you show me that? Because. because. I know what it's like to spend your life chasing ghosts. York never gave up on her. He didn't choose Texas over her, and for years he stayed optimistic that he'd be able to see her again and make amends. But he couldn't. It isn't much, but it's still enough to get Carolina to soften up. She's able to recognize that Epsilon was hurt by the director just as she was, and the two find connection in that. He still has a lot of files to go through, but she takes him into her armor's AI slot. Back at the temple, the Reds and Blues are anxious about having been left alone with Wash. They send Caboose to spy on him, but he doesn't think that it's especially necessary. Oh, come on, Agent. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure yeah, we can trust you. I mean, we are friends. It's a small moment, but you can tell with this declaration of friendship from Caboose that Wash is realizing it is a truth. These are his friends, and he hasn't had those in a long time. Even the other freelancers never really respected him for who he is. Wash feels obligated to help Carolina, and he still wants revenge on behalf of the Alpha and the pain that the project caused both of them, but not at the expense of the people that he's grown to care about. When Carolina and Church return, the team heads back to Valhalla and Texas crash site. Tucker confronts Church about how close he's gotten to Carolina, uncomfortable with the threat of losing his friend again. Even with how much grief they all give each other, they do still give a shit. Meanwhile, the Reds have essentially come home and have almost immediately settled back in. When they get back to their base, they find that Donut managed to survive thanks to Doc. Washington is starting to feel the weight of Carolina's expectations on him and is starting to recognize that the person he is when he's around her is someone that he doesn't care for anymore. Carolina and Church are pushing all of them away with their abrasiveness and their refusal to disclose their intentions. The Reds have already resolved that they're not going with her any further. Church pulls her aside and tries to convince her that she needs to let go of the old grudges that are keeping her from opening up. As a tentative gesture of trust, Carolina admits to him that she hated Texas and felt incapable of competing against her. Church assures her that if Tex really was the best, then it would be her standing there instead. Carolina grows quiet at this and pulls out the dog tags that Wash found in the wreckage. They're Connie's tags. Church heads inside the drive to sift through the data, and as he goes through everything that Texas was given, the last of the walls on his memory are lifted. He knows where to find the director. The two of them take the squad down to the simulation room under the red base. Church uses the holographic tech to allow him a makeshift body as he and Carolina go over their plans to confront the director at his hideout. This new, far more dangerous objective is shot down by everyone else. The Reds have no desire to continue risking their lives for a fight that they don't believe in, especially for someone who's shown them no amount of trust and has only seen them as tools so far. They helped save Epsilon. They followed her every dead end up until this point, but they're not going to sacrifice themselves for this. Carolina gets angry and desperate as she gives orders that no one respects. And then Wash turns on her when she points her gun at Tucker, his friend. Wash is tired of causing pain to the people that he cares about. Church's rage overtakes him, and Omega almost seems to be co-conscious as his form looms over his friends, and he finally snaps. What's your problem? You're my problem! You've always been my problem! Each and every one of you is just a problem that I have to deal with on a daily basis!
Guys. The regret is immediate, but the damage is done. Guys, uh, wait a minute. Forget it, Church. We don't need them. I don't know what's gotten into you, Carolina. You better figure out the difference between your enemies and your friends. Carolina and Church are alone, and they've done this to themselves. The two leave Valhalla for the storage facility that the director has hold himself up in. There are no guards, no soldiers on the premises. It's just them. Phyllis opens the door when Epsilon tells her to, recognizing him as the director just as she did before. Phyllis is briefly confused, unaware that the director had even left. With the confirmation that their target is here, the two head inside. Back at Valhalla, an attempt at rediscovering the conflict between the Reds and the Blues has begun. Unfortunately for the Reds, having Wash as their new leader means that the Blues are perpetually kicking their ass. The tradition of humiliation in exchange for the base's flag is a lot less fun than it was the first few times. Now it's just getting kinda sad. The Blues have more or less taken everything of value from them, including Simmons' dignity, but there is one thing that the Reds have left. Griff has been holding on to Maine's weapon ever since they threw him off the cliff. Washington is incredulous that they take such an advanced piece of weaponry and use it as a wall ornament. But Doc thinks that it's cool to have a token of their adventures, and he remarks on the growth that they've all been through since the series started, and how even he managed to finally keep a patient alive. It's been difficult, and things didn't always go the way that they'd hoped, but in the end, they all got what they wanted. And not everyone. These guys have been through too much together to give up on each other now. Church has always been an asshole, and that hasn't stopped them from helping him out yet. Besides, they gave Wash a second chance and he shot Donut. Project Freelancer might have fancy equipment, and their agents might have had advanced training, but the Reds and Blues have consistently kicked their asses in spite of that, because they have something that Freelancer never did. Trust in each other. Washington realizes that Sarge is right, and after everything that he's been through, Maybe this is what he was looking for all along. The team resolves to catching up with Church and Carolina, who are already deep inside of the director's hideout. There's still no one else here, and they're both getting a weird feeling that this is all too familiar somehow. Over the system speakers, they can hear Phyllis talking to the director, voicing her concern that it's been several days since he last rested. Church assures Carolina that he has her back, and they step through a teleportation gate to the next level. They're met with dozens of robots, each possessed with a failed attempt at recreating the beta AI. The director never stopped trying to get his Allison back. As one would expect from a room full of Agent Texas, they're spurred into a fight. None of them has enough of a personality of their own to do much more than act on instinct. Any attempt at a conversation would be impossible, but it wouldn't matter anyways. Carolina sees this as her chance to finally prove herself against the shadow that's been hanging over her head for so many years, and she fights them. Church is overwhelmed from being surrounded by so many ex-girlfriends, but Carolina needs him. She still has her speed booster from her time with the project, and she puts him to use facilitating her suit's power draw. It works for a time, but Church isn't used to this sort of thing. He shouts at her to slow down, to calm down, but she refuses to listen. And she crashes, just like she did before. And like before, she's picked up by a friend. The Reds and Blues have come just in time to help her. Church makes a non-apology, resolving to make some cheesy speech about how much he appreciates them later, and they get to work. Getting to see our cast animated like this is such a treat. It's the last fight sequence in the series that Monty worked on before he left to work on Ruby, and it's so much fun to see everyone working together. For the Reds and Blues, they're finally able to truly work together as a team, and for the former freelancers, they're getting to fight with a group of people that they can actually trust to have their backs. They're friends. Ultimately, it's up to Church to finish this fight. Mirroring Tex's attempt to save Alpha, Epsilon reaches out for the broken fragment of Allison. She's in bad shape. She doesn't recognize him or even her name when he tells her. She is so tired. So Church tells her that she needs to rest. And he says goodbye. She hates goodbyes. And he knows why. The bots go down, and what's next is for Carolina and Church to handle alone. 
They don't find a fight. As the director told the chairman in his final message, they find an old man whose mind is more weary with memory than it is with hope. For days on end now, he's been rewatching the last video that he ever took of Allison before she left to fight in the war, hoping that there's something about her that he's missed that might allow him to bring her back. Carolina recognizes the pain in him and that he's already suffering under the weight of his mistakes. But Epsilon's system and all of his fragments are still angry at their abuser. He was brilliant and we trusted him. But he, he lied, lied to us. us. He, he twisted, twisted and tortured, tortured us and used us. Manipulated us for his own purposes and for what? For what? For this? For this? 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 Shadow? Shadow? He needs to pay. Carolina looks the director in the eyes one last time, and it's with this that the audience realizes the truth. She is his daughter. And all this time she's been fighting the ghost of her mother for her father's approval. Themes of identity in this show are so prevalent. How the past affects who you are and the choices that you make in respond to that, either staying the same or becoming someone that's more true to your nature. For most of the women in this show, that theme is rooted in how they are defined by the men in their lives and what they do to combat that. Both Texas and Carolina are defined by the relationship to the director. Texas was unwillingly tied to him, her own person, but still the culmination of someone else's grief. It took her years to find her own path, and in the end, it was still the project's original goals that she left church for. Carolina's mother died when she was six years old. Her relationship with her father was distant while growing up. The director was always busy with his own work until she joined the project with York. At that point, in combination with her tendency towards competition, she did everything that she could to ensure that she was his favorite agent. And then Texas showed up. Because Carolina never had the chance to really know her mother, I don't believe that she ever truly realized who it was that she was fighting against during her time with the project. Texas certainly didn't realize that she was fighting her former self's child, not until the very end. Tex had told Alpha Church that she would have given up everything to save Carolina. And now we know why. She looks at the man who made her, the man whose attention she was always striving for, whose love she desired, who hurt her and the people that she cared about and led them to their deaths. And she finally sees him for who he is. A man who's been driven by his grief for so long that he can't move forward. Not even for her. And she forgives him. We're leaving. I thought we came all this way to kill him. Church, remember what you learned in the memory unit? You need to let go. Your past doesn't define who you are. It just gives you the starting point for who you're going to be. Carolina leaves him her pistol, despite knowing what he's likely to do with it. He tells her that she was his greatest creation, and they leave him to find his end. Phyllis erases all of the project's files, save for the video that he's watching, and she shuts down the facility systems. Life support is taken offline, and then he's gone. I think that it's important to note that the series doesn't imply that the director was ever redeemed with this death, which is a trope that drives me up a goddamn wall. His actions are never excused by any of the other characters, and even Carolina doesn't see these last moments as atonement for his crimes. In the end, Dr. Leonard Church is a broken man whose obsession with sacrificing himself for the greater good ultimately destroyed his chances at a real relationship with this child, the last piece of his wife that he had left, and his grief quite literally broke him into pieces. His sacrifice never meant anything in the end. He didn't get what he wanted, and the last shred of kindness that he was even offered was out of pity. Carolina is forgiving him for her own sake. It's her new fight to redeem her soul, and it's a war that she intends to win. After it's all said and done, it's time for them to go home. The Reds and Blues, including Wash, have settled in a canyon as Carolina and Church take on a new mission. There's still freelancer tech out there that needs to be kept out of the wrong hands. It'd be nice to be the good guys for a change, and they have a lot of wrongs that need to be righted. Hopefully, they can find a way to be good enough someday. Just before they leave, Carolina offers up some advice that she learned from her mother. Did I ever tell you about my mother? <laughs> no, I don't think you ever did. She wasn't around a lot when I was a kid. And when she was, she could only stay a short time. Seems like she always had somewhere else to be. Something important to do. And when she left, she wouldn't say goodbye to me. 
Instead, she always told me, never say goodbye. If you don't say goodbye, then you aren't really gone. You just aren't here right now. Your mother sounds like a smart lady. She was. She really was. Had terrible taste in men, though. Hey, Church! Church! Come down here! We want to show you something! Church! Church? Hey, Caboose, you find Church? No, I... I didn't find him. Well, where do you think he is? I don't know. Somewhere. He's just dying right now. This is the first finale that a number of fans have decided would have made a solid ending for the series. If this were the hero's journey, then we've closed the circle, concluding with the ambiguity of what seems like a return to the old status quo. Two sets of characters on either side of a box canyon in the middle of nowhere, while our main protagonists have gone off on a new adventure elsewhere. And in some ways, I can see why it would work. All of the threads from Project Freelancer have been handled, with the director dealt with, and the two remaining agents having made the conscious decision to move forward with their lives. But it's not the end. And these final shots of season 10 set up our final arc of this video. The Chorus Trilogy. It's been a while since I've done one of these, so uh, let's get caught up to speed. With Trocadero back to score the series, season 11 opens up with voiceover from Washington as he goes over the events of the series so far. He explains that while they were on their way back to Earth after ending Project Freelancer once and for all, they were shipwrecked on a planet in the middle of nowhere. Now the boys are in a box canyon once again as they try to make contact with the outside world. Wash is doing his best to hold his team together, with Carolina and Church having left without telling anyone where they were going. He's starting to worry about their dwindling supplies, and he can't help but be paranoid. He's just got a feeling that something is interfering with their attempts at getting rescued. Looking for normalcy, Wash has begun taking his role as Blue Team's leader much more seriously. More than Tucker or Caboose are used to. It's the first time since they got together that Wash has actually had to do anything with his newfound leadership role, since the Reds aren't exactly a threat, and Carolina came back onto the scene relatively soon after he went into hiding after Maine's death. And though he's gone through some character growth, Carolina's return led to him regressing a bit. His healing process has relied on him being able to get away from what the project had made him into, so when Carolina came back and took command of the first group of people that he'd been able to trust in years, he fell back into his old habits. If you grew up with a less than healthy home life, then you probably know how going back can bring out a version of yourself that you don't want to be anymore. Washington acted more like his younger self when Carolina came back into the picture, but thanks to his relationships with the Reds and Blues, he was able to stand up to her, and in the end, they were able to reach an accord. But now that she's gone, and he and the others are in a crisis, he's taken responsibility and is mimicking what that looks like to him. In this case, a sergeant. But, but like, a real one, not, not like Sarge. Unfortunately for Wash, this new attitude is causing him to clash with Tucker and Caboose. Mostly Tucker. Neither of them are used to having to actually run drills and act like they're in the military. When Church was in charge, they really didn't do anything, and if something fucked up, he'd take the fall for it. Washington's old training is preventing him from loosening up on Tucker, but with Caboose, we can see that Wash has retained some of his old compassion. Back during his time with the project, Washington seemed to gravitate most towards North and York, the two members of the team who were the most openly compassionate and thoughtful. Wash always tried to be kind as well, though it often got him burned thanks to his teammates' poor attitudes. Now with Caboose, he's showing his preference to listen and find understanding. Caboose is the member of the group who has always been particularly open about his feelings, even when that tendency often clashes with his friends, and he almost shows a rejection of toxic masculinity in that way. Similarly, Wash responds to openness with his own vulnerability. While Caboose is in a depressive slump from losing his best friend yet again, Washington helps to talk him down and convinces him to take a walk to clear his head. It doesn't seem to help much at first, but then Caboose finds something in the wreckage to keep him occupied. Over with the Red Squad, attempts are being made to make their half of the wreckage more comfortable. Until Sarge designates half of their new base as his, and the other half is relegated for both Simmons and Griff to share. Once again, the Reds have returned to their role of cause problems on accident that we'll have to deal with later. Firstly, with Griff being a terrible roommate and causing Simmons to start to lose it, and secondly, by building a new robot from a kit that they recovered in the crash. Ladies, I would like to introduce you to the newest addition to Red Team. Can it talk? Hola. You've oh, got to be kidding! Oh, come on! Huh. 
That is an unfortunate coincidence. Initially, this isn't that big a deal. When the Reds head over to offer Lopez Dos Poinos assistance on repairing the comm tower, he manages to fix it despite Wash's refusal. Of course, the robot doesn't get the credit, but Wash is able to finally send out a mayday. Donut is the one who answers their call. Despite the distress signal getting picked up and their team's overall optimism, Wash is still unconvinced. And it doesn't help that Caboose has quite literally made himself a new best friend. A military assault droid that he's named Freckles. Yeah, I call him Freckles because of the spots on his nose. Well, shit, actually I have to give it to Caboose on this one. Robot definitely looks more like Freckles than a mantis. This sets off a series of misfortunes among the Reds, with Sarge falling back into the delusion that the Blues are an enemy once again, while a new threat is a lot closer than they think. His delusions are fueled even further when Simmons is driven off by Griff being a terrible roommate and he goes to stay with the Blues to enjoy the order that Wash has been maintaining. Tucker and Wash start arguing more about their situation, with the intensity of his command and the non-stop training pushing Tucker to a breaking point. Wash's paranoia is preventing him from letting up, and the argument escalates as the Reds show up. An innocuous statement accidentally overrides Freckles' command structure and places Caboose as the team leader and forces Simmons to stay as a recognized member of the team. Sarge's delusion only worsens at this, and Freckles nearly shoots him before Donut comes to the rescue. He's finally come to their aid, bringing Doc and Lopez the first head with him, but something was lost in translation along the way because instead of bringing a rescue team, the ship that brought Donut here dropped them off and left. Before the pilot has a chance to get off of the planet, he stops to refuel. He remarks to the attendant that someone should probably report the shipwreck, and he starts to make the call himself. He's taken out by a new antagonist before he can get that chance. He'll be revealed in more detail later on, but this is Locus. He's one of those characters that I'm always excited to see, so you can probably guess from my saying that what his character arc will be like. With Simmons now technically kidnapped by the Blues, Sarge leads Doc and Griff onto the wrecked ship to find something that will provide them with superior firepower. They see Wash on the ship as well, looking for something, but they don't engage him. Instead, Sarge manages to find his own massive robot. Could you please stop referring to the robot as a woman? It's really weird. Griff also found these teleportation grenades that can store things in a subspace dimension and then bring them back when the right frequency is activated. Donut uses these, quote, future cubes to chuck Griff's mess from his side of the base across the canyon so that it winds up in blue base. This throws Simmons into a full-blown meltdown. Tucker and Wash are getting frustrated with each other again, but when Tucker admits that he's missing church, Wash responds again with vulnerability. He tells Tucker that he was the worst member on the freelancer team, and that being a leader isn't something he's ever really had to do before. But now that Carolina and Church have left, he's trying too hard to fill that void. Tucker tells him that all that really made Church leader was taking the blame when shit went wrong. Wash relaxes a little bit at this, though he keeps pushing Tucker to try and see that he's more capable than he believes. Washington leaves Tucker behind to help Caboose at the base, while he goes to finish a project that he started on the shipwreck. He's met with the hostile Freckles when he returns, and fortunately, Caboose de-escalates the situation before coming down to speak with him. And this is probably one of the biggest turning points in Washington's character arc, because despite his claims that he's not good at emotions, he's consistently responsive to his friends when they express vulnerability to him, and he's always met their anxieties with compassion. And this highlights another theme that's been running through this show this entire time. Toxic masculinity. Throughout the show, the majority of our cast character flaws have been rooted in toxic masculinity. And before anyone tries to whine at me that I'm hating on men, this includes the women in the series. You wouldn't think that a trans guy with like 38 subscribers would have to go on the defense about this, but my last video had randos calling me a Nazi for being anti-colonialist and anti-eugenics as though that math maths. So I guess this is where we're at now. Toxic masculinity isn't about all men are bad. Instead, it's a social construct where, due to societal expectations, individuals engage in behaviors that are damaging to themselves and those around them. And yes, it does tend to largely affect men. Classic gamer culture is full of toxic masculinity, from queerphobia and sexism to unwarranted aggression and a suppression of emotions that, if presented, would cause the individual to be considered weak. Under a toxic patriarchy, affection, empathy, and sadness are seen as less valuable compared to anger and aggression. With only a few exceptions, most of whom are already dead when they're introduced, the bulk of the cast falls victim to this mentality. Church was perpetually angry all of the time, possibly as a trauma response, but it still wasn't healthy. When we first meet Agent Texas, she's using a voice modulator to disguise herself as a man in order to be taken more seriously, and she often uses violence as the solution to her problems. 
Carolina's initial arc saw her overcoming the ideals and behaviors expected of her by the toxic men in her life, and her anger was fostered at the expense of her ability to connect with others. Tucker's entire personality is based around being a sexist horn dog who doesn't respond well to women if they're not available for him to conquer. He also refuses to apply himself at things that he isn't immediately good at, because trying would imply that he possesses any amount of weakness that needs overcoming. Simmons is actively struggling with a complex that he developed as a child because his mostly absent father didn't consider him to be manly enough, and Sarge is... Which reminds me! Ow! Donut, give me a glass! Oh! <laughs> I'm making orange juice. Girl. Every time. My point is that, aside from Caboose, mostly because he's more or less ignorant of the pressures on him, the show is filled with characters who are suffering as a result of both self-imposed and socially imposed ideals of quote, true masculinity. So when Washington does this... <sighs> I'm sorry, Caboose. I'm sorry your best friend left you without saying goodbye. Mm -hmm. Maybe he thought you would try to stop him, or maybe it was just too hard for him to tell you, but no matter the reason, he's still gone. He left you. Both of you. I don't really do emotional things, and I hoped you might be able to get over this by yourself, so I left you alone. And instead of coming to terms with what you lost, you replaced it with, well, the first thing you found. But I should have been there for you, Caboose. <sighs> because... That's what friends do for each other. Captain Caboose is not your friend. He is your commanding. Uh... No, we're, we're all friends here, Freckles. It's... You know... That's right. And as your friend, I want to say that I'm sorry. I know it's not much, but... I'm gonna make you this. Oh my god! My old helmet! I feel like this really matters, not just for Wash as a character who's been fighting against his inherently compassionate nature since joining Project Freelancer, but for the whole of the cast because it takes a moment to address that part of their problems have come about by their inability to be open and honest with each other. Does this have a significant impact on our characters as we go forward? I, I mean, I'll be honest, I do wish that it did more because there is a hell of a lot worth of trying to unpack with these guys. but. This does introduce a new status quo to the series, where this kind of dialogue is able to exist, and we get to see what that does for the characters' actions going forward. And speaking of action, the Reds nearly blow themselves up with the nuclear robot before it shuts itself off. And then the canyon is attacked. Washington is initially reluctant to kill them without having any information on who their attackers are, but Tucker makes a valid point that they need to defend themselves. Wash orders Freckles to take out their attackers, and when the bullets stop flying, they all regroup. Locus reveals himself to our team, and before Wash takes a sniper round, another stranger shows up with a shield. This is Felix. Locus shoots Felix in the leg before coming down to taunt him, and it's pretty clear that these two have experience with each other. Locus intends to bring the Reds and Blues back with him, either now or later. He leaves when Freckles fires on his position. Doc patches up Felix, and we finally get an explanation about what is going on here. This planet is Chorus, and it was more or less abandoned by the UNSC after the war. Now, without oversight from Earth, they've claimed their independence, but now the Federation and the New Republic are fighting for the rights to leadership. Locus is with the Feds, and Felix with the Rebels. Both sides of this conflict have heard about the Reds and Blues' takedown of Project Freelancer, and they look up to them as heroes who could turn the tide of this war. None of the cast members are particularly interested in fighting for them, but whether they like it or not, they're part of this now. Felix calls for reinforcements, knowing that Locus will return with more forces to try and take the canyon. Washington refuses to trust a stranger so quickly when Felix starts asking for their supply details, but he's worn down by the need to keep himself and his friends safe from an assault. While his team are getting ready for a fight, Felix tells him that the Federation has gotten its hands on the same experimental tech that Freelancer used. Not as powerful, but more refined. Wash agrees to show Felix what tech is available on the shipwreck, and comes back looking a little bit more like his old self, while still retaining who he's become. The Reds make their own preparations to defend their base, during which Griff demonstrates what he and Doc have learned about the future cubes. Unfortunately, Doc gets pulled into the grenade's radius and doesn't come back with the supplies, and no one recognizes that he's vanished but Lopez. After finally recognizing that he's never going to be respected, Dos.0 gets fed up with Sarge's asininity to the point that, while making repairs to the Cyclops, he decides to take over the bot with his own programming. 
and he couldn't have had better timing because it's then that Locust returns. For the first time in a while, we get a machinimated action sequence. For his animation work on the series, Monty Ohm was given the position of showrunner and lead animator on Rooster Teeth's other flagship series, Ruby. While it's nice to get back to basics for this season, future animated scenes in this show definitely suffer thanks to the loss of his creative vision, but that's neither here nor there, because the fight escalates. Donut takes out Dose.0, but Freckles is nearly out of power, and Felix's backup isn't coming fast enough. Donut gets shot, Bosch gets knocked out by an energy weapon, and then Sarge is hit. The group is forced to split up when the rebels finally arrive, and Wash sacrifices himself so that his friends can get to safety. Tucker is hit in the back of a head by a rock during the cave-in, and he wakes up later at the New Republic base with Felix, Griff, Simmons, and Caboose. Everyone else had to be left behind. We've seen these guys fail before, they're pretty good at it, but seeing these guys as the only ones to make it out to safety kinda hits pretty hard. Felix takes them to meet with Kimball, the leader of the New Republic. She explains that the youngest of her soldiers look up to them for their accomplishments. The rebels believe that they'll be the key to winning this war. They're all reluctant and just want to go home, but Kimball tells them that their friends were taken in alive by the feds, and she makes them a deal. Help them win the war, and they'll help them get their friends back, and give them a ship off the planet. They're in this together now, so it's time to start training. As we focus back on Locus, we watch him make contact with his superior, an entity called Control. And as we pull back, we see that Carolina and Church have intercepted their communications. To take another break from talking about the characters and plot, I really want to bring up the music again. Mostly because I can't help myself, but also because the Chorus Trilogy's musical identity is centered on this particular track, Contact. Trocadero have been pretty intimately connected to the series ever since about May of 2003, and even Jeff Williams, who was the main composer for season 8 through 10, was the band's keyboardist before he moved forward to do his own work with Rooster Teeth on other projects. There's a pretty distinct style to his music, leaning into alternative and rock sounds that gave the freelancers a really unique feel, while the soundtrack is a whole never strayed too far from the core vibe of space blues that have come to represent both the main cast and the series core narrative. Contact fully embodies that original identity, while the lyrics bring in themes and symbolism of the conflicts that the cast are facing. They are reluctant heroes, just as they've always been, but now the fate of an entire planet's worth of people rests on their shoulders, and victory won't come without making some sacrifices. Season 12 starts as Griff, Simmons, and Caboose are leading an infiltration mission with the Rebels. And I'm really fond of this opener. For the first time in a while, we get to see traditional animation mixed with the machinima, but it isn't solely about the fight choreography anymore. Griff's frustration comes through in his mannerisms, and the dismissive way that he flips off Simmons is just such a fun little character moment. We see more of this blending of styles soon after as their mission winds up going really poorly. Fortunately, or maybe not, Kimball appears and reveals that all of this was a training assignment versus a real one. But despite their failings, the privates all still look up to them. That's enough capture the flag for today. Whoa, and what the hell are we supposed to say? Hey guys, sorry you still suck. Turns out we suck too. At least we have something in common. Tell them what they need to hear. Tell them that they can do this, and that next time, they will be better. So you want us to lie to them? No. I don't. Kimball is a really refreshing addition to the series. She has her own character flaws that are informed by her trauma as a victim of war, but she's also incredibly compassionate and driven to protect her troops. But she's not ignorant to the fact that, given the nature of war, not everyone will make it out alive. She won't compromise her principles, but she is committed to doing what needs to be done to save her people. Tucker and his squad are with Felix on a hit-and-run mission against a Federation outpost, tasked with planting explosives and getting back out, ideally undetected. When Tucker overhears a couple of soldiers talking about Washington, he gives himself the new objective of acquiring intel on the Fed's bases. It's going surprisingly well until Locus appears. Tucker only narrowly gets out, but two of his undercover squad mates are killed in the process. Felix nearly chews him out for not following orders, but he respects the attitude, since it did get them information. Even Kimball approves, accepting that losses are going to happen, and the information that he acquired will help the rebels beyond going after Washington and the others. Kimball recognizes that while the Reds and Blues work well together, they still really suck at leading. She won't sign off on a rescue mission until they can prove to her that they can go on a mission without getting more of her people killed. A member from each of their squads is brought in for the potential mission, and Tucker takes the spot of leader because he's willing to live with the consequences of whatever might happen. 
I really appreciate this growth for him. He's been the most capable member of the team since his ambassadorship with the aliens, so this kind of feels like a natural evolution for him, especially since now he's lost both of the leadership figures that he looked up to and befriended. The training doesn't exactly go well, and a literal highlight reel is made out of their squad's failings to take down Felix as the sole objective. Tucker is getting really frustrated at Felix for being so hard on them, so Kimball takes him aside to have something of a heart-to-heart. She explains that Felix has been in this fight for years, helping the rebels on their missions and recovering from setbacks. He's been here since before she even joined the army, and she tells Tucker that she's the fourth person to be in charge of the New Republic's forces. Everyone else before her was killed in battle or assassinated. Felix is here because of Locus. The two are former teammates and rivals in the military during the war. Felix had been with the Rebels for years before Locus was brought in, and Locus took the job knowing that he'd be fighting against a former ally. This is their chance to finally get even with each other. We all have our reasons for fighting, Tucker. And I know that yours are your friends. Your five days are almost up, and I don't know when we're going to get another chance like this. Tucker goes back to his friends and finds Griff in a crisis, having just embodied Sarge while snapping at his subordinate. He tells them to stop what they're doing and follow him, leaving the lieutenants behind as he explains their new plan to take on the rescue mission alone. They've never been real soldiers, but they took down CT and the meta despite that. They don't need to risk the lieutenants' lives, and they'll probably be fine going out on their own. Tucker has the coordinates of the base where Wash and the others are being held, so they just need to get there. They take a couple of warthogs and leave a message behind for the squad. There's a close call when the guys stop for gas and nearly miss encountering a group of soldiers in black armor who seem to be working for Locus but they disappear. With that it resolved, the team gets moving. And as we've come to expect from them, being idiots actually works to their advantage. They get into the base by going under the ice, and then distract the base's forces by breaking the sewage pipes. The last hitch in their plan is getting the door to the facility open, and unfortunately Simmons doesn't work well under pressure. Oh shit! Tucker? Wash? What in Sam hell are you boys doing here? We came to save you, but we were supposed to save you! Ba, ba, ba. Several weeks ago, Washington, Donut, and Sarge were taken by Locust's forces to a Federation base just outside of the capital. They all sustained an amount of physical trauma, with Wash having required surgery for a severe wound to the back of the head by the uncomfortably cheerful Dr. Emily Gray. After they're released from their cells, they're met with the Fed's leader. General Donald Doyle is a man who is definitely not cut out for this line of work. He passes out when Wash threatens him, and he's only the leader because everyone else who was qualified died, and he happened to be the next down the line of succession. Like the rebels, they have their reasons for fighting, and they definitely don't seem to be as menacing as Felix made them sound. Doyle, in particular, is less so the leader of the army than Locus is officially in charge, but recognizing Locus's utility and his being the reason for maintaining their bases and equipment. Washington and the others agree to assist the feds, but he's keeping some distance between his goals and the new acquaintances thanks to his paranoia. They pull Lopez from the garbage, and Locus gives Washington Freckle's storage unit with the programming intact. It's not exactly a concession, given what he's done to them, but Wash accepts his token anyways. These two are really fascinating foils to each other in this arc, with Locus as Washington's moral opposite. Locus does what he does because of his time in the UNSC, where he grew to see himself as only capable of following orders, no matter what they might entail. He values greatly the ideal of being the perfect soldier, and it's because of this that he sees Washington as a disappointment for wasting his potential. Locus is incapable of recognizing that who Wash was before would have destroyed him if he hadn't gotten away. Where Washington is healing from what scarred him, Locus is a wound left untreated. Their character work is something that I find especially compelling. This show has always been pretty clearly anti-war, and honestly, even anti-American military-industrial complex in general. And if that string of words sounds like a lot, that's because it is. But it's relevant given how the core cast all seems to have been born in North America, which for this brand of sci-fi means the states as far as culture goes. It's actually a great juxtaposition against the game franchise that the series is being made from. I've only played up to Halo 3 and ODST before the lack of subtitles prevented me from going any further in reach. But that was enough time for me to get acquainted with the UNSC's hypernationalism. 
Sergeant Johnson is basically every stereotype about the American military that you can imagine, and at the risk of tangenting, I'm almost certain that the creators meant it unironically. Halo CE came out during the Bush administration, shortly after 9-11. This was during a time at which even my anti-military grandfather, who was drafted from Vietnam and saw military incompetence at its finest, was gung-ho about going to war against the Middle East. And I very distinctly remember playing Halo 2 and thinking, damn, this is a product of his time. Though development had obviously started long before they came out, the first couple of Halo games present as a franchise about war and about role-playing as the gold standard for what a soldier should be. And honestly, that makes the show's easter eggs feel very strange. They're cute and they're fun to find out in the wild, but the general vibe of the show stands almost opposed to that of the game that it got its start in. In Red vs. Blue, the main cast are technically soldiers, but throughout the series we've seen that they're victims of systemic corruption, not heroes saving the day for a perceived greater purpose. And it gets more fucked up when you realize that a lot of the characters are actually disenfranchised young men. Tucker is black, Griff and Kakaina are Hawaiian, and Donut grew up on a farm in Iowa. It's pretty well established knowledge that the American military, for which the UNSC is an analog, often makes recruitment efforts for young men that are vulnerable due to marginalization and lower income. The military is seen as a viable path towards paying for college because this country fucking sucks and education is expensive as hell. The military has even used video game events, including Halos, to lure in potential recruits. Keith David, who voices Admiral Anderson in the Mass Effect games, has been used in the Navy's recruiting advertisements for years. And this insidious recruitment strategy is all pretty sinister when you look at the statistics of veterans who are homeless or commit suicide due to a lack of financial aid and mental health support. I am completely anti-military, which, yes, I know appears weird given that every video I've made so far is about media based in military sci-fi. I have a great deal of criticism to lob at the American military industrial complex for the way that it preys on marginalized folks in an effort to fuel its imperialist expansion. And while I'm critical of the military, and I always will be, I can empathize with those who saw it as their best chance for better opportunities. I'm very much an advocate for veterans' rights to the support that they deserve, especially with how overfunded the American military is. Nearly every veteran that I know personally, be they family or friend, has had issues with getting access to the resources that they need, and it's only due to external support that they were able to carry on. There's a running theory in the fandom that Caboose was actually part of Halo's Spartan program, but due to injury, he was relocated to the Blue Sim Troopers because it was easier to keep him in the system as an expendable resource than to properly discharge him and provide him with the benefits that he's earned. This is hinted at with a comment he made about receiving a Purple Heart, an award that's given to soldiers who are injured in the line of duty. Regardless of the actual validity of that fan theory, given that Caboose has memories of a childhood, the mere existence of the Sim Troopers as part of the UNSC contributes to the military's apathy towards its forces. Being a soldier means nothing if you can't trust the people that you take your orders from or believe in what you're fighting for. Washington learned that lesson the hard way when he realized that some orders weren't worth following through on. It took winding up in prison and a near-death experience for him to realize that there was more to life than continuing to fight meaningless battles. War never ends well, regardless of the intentions on either side. Author Catherine Applegate wrote a really excellent letter to her fan base after publishing the final book in the Animorphs series, where she explains why a story about traumatized child soldiers was never going to have a happy ending. Because that's a lie that's been sold to us through propaganda and pop culture funded by the military. No matter the outcome of war, you're still left with traumatized people, be it those who fought or those whose lives are uprooted by the conflict, and neither are given the resources that they need to truly recover. There's no glory in a battle won, only death and more fighting around the corner. The UNSC threw the reds and blues at each other because they were seen as an expendable resource, and they were abandoned when there was no longer a project to use them. Chorus is an entire planet that was forgotten by Earth after they ceased to be useful as a frontline in their war, and this abandonment only led to more conflict and fighting by people who couldn't find a purpose that wasn't fueled by violence, and now their civilians have been forced to continue that conflict. These themes of military corruption in the show only run deeper as the two halves of our team finally regroup. Washington comes to the notion that both sides' leaders need to be sat down and given a chance to properly talk so that they can avoid further deaths. They're all about to leave when those soldiers in black return. They begin killing the Federation soldiers at the base, and it's revealed that they were indeed working for Locus. And when Felix arrives and starts monologuing, it quickly becomes obvious that there's a lot more to this war than we've seen so far. Stop boasting and let me kill them. We have a job to do. Oh, that's right. He doesn't like you guys. <laughs> he actually thinks there might be a few fighters among you. <laughs> Told you he's crazy. But why? Why the capture? Why make us part of this war? <laughs> well, you see... Felix? No. I've had to put up with these morons every day, so you let me have this. You see, someone 
somewhere out in our galaxy has their eyes set on this planet. The only problem is the inhabitants. Now, if it were up to me, I'd just nuke this place from orbit. But our employer has other ideas. Holy shit. It's actually them. Back off. Control wants them alive. Oh no. We have to play this thing carefully, you understand? If an entire planet dies overnight, well, people ask questions. But if you stumble onto this rock and find that the settlers killed each other, well, that's just a tragedy. Our first leader was killed in action. The second was assassinated at what we had been told would be a peace treaty. And the third was blown out of the sky while trying to leave Chorus for help. It was you. You started this war. Ah, wrong. These people hated each other way before our operation ever showed up. We just had to keep the hate train a-going. And let me tell you, you guys have helped so much. Does it hurt? Knowing just how much death you've brought to this planet. Enough! How many times must I tell you, if you want to make the victim suffer, you do it quickly and efficiently? There will be no rescue for you. You will die here today, along with the rest. No one will find your bodies. No one will know the truth. And no one is going to stop us from killing every last person on this planet. All right. That's all I need to hear. Kill them! The fuck are you? Caroline is back. It's pretty evident from her reintroduction that the animation team took a pretty big hit from when Moni left. The contrast between the absolute badass that we got to follow for two seasons and the nerfed version that we get here is rather stark. The choreography is impressive on its own, but it lacks the same weight and impact, while the camera does little more than some slight tracking. Carolina even gets stabbed in the leg to prevent her from pulling off more impressive movesets, as though the team realized that she was too powerful for the new animation style. I know that it's intended to showcase that Felix is a strong enough fighter to beat one of the series' best, but the animation really does break that illusion. Even with her new injury, Carolina is able to get her friends to safety with the teleporter cube, and they bring Dr. Gray with them. You know, I never thought I'd be so glad to see you idiots again. Carolina? Uh, that's not all. Miss me, assholes? You fuck! Huh. Wasn't expecting that. Not too long ago, Carolina and Church were continuing their personal quest to take out mercenaries who were scavenging for old tech, and we can see that the two have formed a pretty close and familial friendship with each other. They bicker like siblings, and Epsilon even calls her sis at times. We can also see that Epsilon has formally adopted all of the other fragments into his system as he strategizes Carolina's plan of attack. Though he's still a weaker fragment, and he struggles with running multiple pieces of Carolina's gear at once, Epsilon's become much more stable since starting to work with these other fragments. His system is now working closer to how it may have been intended for Alpha had they not been forcefully removed. Delta and Theta help him with the planing, while Gamma finishes the file transfer. Carolina's gear sustained some damage in the fight, mostly because her signature helmet and armor weren't ported to Halo 4 when Rooster Teeth made the engine switch. The two have been intercepting messages from Control, and this latest one mentions the Sim Troopers. So it's time for a rescue mission. Carolina has softened up a great deal since concluding her vendetta against the project, and I'd like to believe that this version of her is closer to the person that York met at that bar all those years ago. She's still in a less of a hard ass, and she still makes threats to strangers, but there is a fondness in the way that she speaks to the guys, and she's far less aggressive in general. She's actually rather protective, and shows an affection for them in her own way. Church, on the other hand, is still very much Church. He doesn't show much remorse for having left his friends behind, and this creates a rift between him and Tucker. Washington de-escalates the bickering so that Carolina can tell them what they've discovered. The space pirates that they've been fighting appear to have stolen freelancer equipment that was being transported back to the UNSC, which was on the ship that they crashed in. Given the planet's circumstances, Carolina and Church believe that the crash happened on purpose. Now the pirates are reverse engineering the tech and advancing it for their own purposes. This new equipment no longer requires AI assistance to run properly, and they've also begun making modifications to alien weaponry along the way. Assuming the crash was orchestrated to supply the pirates with gear, their goal now becomes to look for a manifest to determine who might be behind it all. The Reds head to crash site Bravo, while the Blues head to Alpha, the other half of the ship. And they need to move fast, because with resources like this, it won't be long before the Civil War escalates past a point of no return. Which is exactly what Felix and Locust are counting on. 
Control's orders are to tell the respective armies of the Reds and Blues deaths, aiming to martyr them in order to spur either side into finishing each other off, once and for all. Felix goes to Kimball to express his sympathies and to give her new information. He tells her that the Federation is gathering in the capital for a rally, and he believes that they should hit them there before the Feds can make a final push. Kimball is reluctant due to the risk involved, but he's given her resolve, so she agrees. Thank you. For everything. I'm just doing my job. Y'all, I fucking hate this dude. There's been a number of antagonists in this series, and I fucking hate this dude. In a good way. He's such a skeevy, manipulative prick, I just want to put my fist through his face. Returning to a moment of levity before they head out, Washington takes Caboose aside when Freckles is mentioned. Uh, I'm not really sure how to tell you this without both confusing you and breaking your disturbingly fragile heart. I am an emotional die bomb! Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Caboose, I'm afraid this is all that's left of Freckles. It's his brain, sort of. Freckles? You're... You're... You're so tiny now! Oh, what? Caboose is absolutely thrilled to have his pet back, regardless of what shape he comes in, and with the added bonus of no longer being able to kill his friends. With Freckles now in tow, the two teams split up to start exploring their respective halves of the ship. The Reds find their objective with ease, given that they'd already been after the Manifest once before. Meanwhile, the Blues head to crash site Alpha, and their ship is clearly not the first to have crashed here. Initially, the coast is clear, but while Church is in the system, the pirates manage to track them down and start attacking. They don't fully finish the file transfer before Tucker makes the command decision to bug out, seeing the risk to their own lives is too high given the numbers that have them cornered. This causes another fight between him and Church, before Carolina re-injures herself neutralizing an enemy that was accidentally brought back with them. While Dr. Gray patches her up, Tucker goes to Wash for advice, feeling like everything that he does fucks things up. Tucker, I know you're frustrated, but you have to realize that making mistakes is just part of the deal. Even with everything you've screwed up, look at how far you've made it. You're not the same person you were back in Blood Gulch. Is it bad that I kinda wish I was? Yes! You were a terrible excuse for a human being. He's not wrong though, and Tucker still has a ways to go, but despite the fuck-ups, he is better than he once was. I really appreciate this blunt honesty about the nature of individual growth because it is a process, and you have to accept that you're likely going to fuck up along the way. There's only so much that you can do about your mistakes, so you have to make amends to whomever may have been hurt by your actions, and recognize that the next chance will be different, because you have the power to make it so. You can't be sure that it's the right choice, but the point is that you keep moving forward. Thanks to the Reds' previous meddling with the ship's records, the manifest is fully intact, but locked down, and Church is struggling to gain access. While he's occupied, Carolina's attempts at interrogating their new prisoner aren't going so well. <laughs> Why won't he talk? She's a little frustrated. I find this line kind of charming, because it really shows the evolution of the team's relationship with Carolina. Ever since her encounter with the director, she's shown an increasing amount of patience for them, and instead of being afraid of her outburst, Simmons and the others are recognizing her emotions as they are even with as loud as they may be. Fortunately for the team, Dr. Gray wants to take a crack at breaking their new prisoner, since it was him and his associates who disintegrated everyone at the last base that she was stationed at. Ooh, what's the matter? Did the big bad freelancer get all tuckered out? Do you know where we are? Huh? This is a remote research facility designed to study the surrounding wildlife. I volunteered at one just like it in grad school. It's got a laboratory, an incinerator, and oodles of state-of-the-art surgical equipment. Would you like to see them? Sarge? I'm scared. Simmons? We're all scared. Wait, except for me. His name is Zachary Miller, he's ex-military, and he was kind enough to hand over the coordinates to a nearby radio jammer. You're kidding. No, silly! I'm Dr. Gray! Ha! That joke! The pirate's pretty amenable to answering questions now. He doesn't know exactly who's in charge of the operation, since only Felix and Locus are the ones who ever communicate with control. But whoever it is has made a hell of an investment into funding this genocide to access the alien tech in the planet's temples. The interrogation is cut short when the pirates find them once again, and Washington realizes that Locus's gesture of goodwill is actually a tracking device. 
It isn't too difficult for Church to scrub freckles of the tracker, but Wash gets chewed out by Carolina for the carelessness. This leads to yet another escalating argument between Tucker and Church, and Tucker can't figure out why Caboose isn't more pissed about his leaving them. If you keep being mean to Church, Church will just keep being mean to you. And then everyone will be mean to everyone all the time, and everything will be bad, and no one will have fun. Is this... are you trying to give a motivational speech right now? Shh, I want to see where he's going. I mean, come on! Is this really what you want? You just... you just want to be angry and mean all the time? Because that is dumb! And you know what? You are not more thinking that! Did Caboose just call someone dumb? Well, that's going the kettle blue. Some church left! And maybe some of us were sad! But you know what? That is okay! Because he was just trying to do something good! And he just made a mistake! And we all make mistakes sometimes! Wow. Caboose, I... So shut up! Get over it! Tucker finally goes to talk with Church, and it's obvious that Delta and Theta have been trying to talk some sense into him as well. It's not a proper apology on either side, since these two are still men mired in social expectations of patriarchal masculinity after all, but they do share an amount of vulnerability with each other and find reconciliation. Their emotional moment gets cut short by a transmission from Felix and Locus. Both the Federation and the New Republic are headed towards a final assault in Armonia, the planet's capital. Though they claim otherwise, it's obvious that they see the Reds and Blues as a threat, so Control has decided to make them a deal. Transport off of Chorus on the condition that they never speak to anyone of what's actually happened here. A way home is all that they've wanted, but things are different now. They can't just let thousands of people die if there's a way for them to stop it, and they're running out of time. The assault is already underway. Our elite squad of misfits is scouting ahead while Kimball leads the charge with the rest of her men. The pirates are getting into position, and they're under orders not to fire unless they catch soldiers trying to flee the city. The rebels get further into the city before the shutters suddenly box them in, and the leaders of both armies finally come face to face. Doyle and Kimball don't immediately attack, instead antagonizing each other until Doyle blames the rebels for the deaths of the Reds and Blues. It's at this point that they're beginning to realize that they might have been led into some kind of trap. And they're not the only ones. Carolina gets caught by the mercs while scouting out the radio jammer, and Wash is able to sneak up on the mercs from behind. Felix orders their men to search the caves for the rest of the team. What did you think seven morons, a couple of freelancers, and an AI would actually be able to do here? What the? Well, not much. But you forgot to count the genius and the dog. The dog? Need signature detected. Did that gun just fucking talk? Dr. Gray has put Freckles into Caboose's rifle and given him control over the trigger. While Wash and Carolina handle Felix and Locust, the rest of the guys finish taking out the pirates that were brought along. The fight choreography is finally starting to improve, and thanks to this looser style, the Reds and Blues are able to get some fun moments, like Griff using his weight to tackle a merc and Lopez punching a merc after getting his head shot off again. But Carolina is still weakened from her recent injuries, and Felix manages to incapacitate her. Locus and Felix split up to handle the team, with Felix going after the Sim Troopers while Locus continues taunting Wash. He's still obsessed with the perceived failure of Washington's personal history, and still unable to understand why he has empathy for the people of Chorus. He isn't one of them, so why go through all this trouble to save them? It's that empathy that truly separates them. You keep trying to play yourself off as some sort of weapon, that you don't care about anyone or anything. But the fact that you're trying so hard to understand me breaks your entire act. No matter how hard you may want to be, you're not a machine, you're a murderer. But you hide behind the idea in your head because you're too afraid to take responsibility for what you've done. I know, I used to be a real piece of shit, but at least I'm trying to do something about it. <clears throat> Locus isn't the only one lacking in empathy. Tucker confronts Felix, and Felix's main character flaw bites him in the ass. It's been pretty well established that Felix is prone to grandiosity and theatrics. He relishes in manipulating people and feeling as though he has the upper hand. It leads to him acting like a classic movie villain, monologuing because he just can't help an opportunity to make his opponent feel small. And with a wonderful callback to the season's earlier shenanigans, it finally fucks him over. I don't know, man. I think I'd rather be rich than a fucking nutjob. What do you think, Church? Yeah, this guy's got no idea what he's talking about. The fuck is this? Oh, this is Church. He's the AI that helps me run my equipment. What equipment? My helmet cam. 
Oh! Somebody just got fucking busted. Once the feds and rebels kill each other, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I mean, we've been playing these guys for years. How did you convince Kimball to go to the capital? Vanessa? Oh, she was easy. I just made up some story about how you all died heroically. You should have seen it, man. I gave the performance of a fucking lifetime. Got all broken up, threw in a few dramatic pauses, and they just ate it up. You son of a bitch. Finally seeing the extent to which they were played, Doyle and Kimball order a ceasefire. Locus's commitment to protocol prevents them from killing the Reds and Blues then and there, but they get away and retreat back to control. With the ceasefire now underway, Washington is more or less made the mediary between the leaders. As they begin the slow process of learning how to work together, Carolina and Epsilon take some time to recoup. With excellent timing, Delta informs him that he's finished getting through the manifest security protocol. It seems that Karn Industries is the one responsible for all of this. Their largest profits come from the sale of weapons and technology, and they formed a pretty tight-knit relationship with the UNSC. Project Freelancer has actually run into them on a few occasions. The insurrectionists were actually a force of UNSC soldiers that Karan had hired to protect their assets. Assets that Project Freelancer used to split the Alpha AI. And as it so happens, the person in charge is someone familiar to us. Colorful Space Marines Stop Corruption. You know, I really love the picture they used for this thing, but I gotta say, I think I like the description even more. Pictured above, the red and blue troopers of Project Freelancer receive a full pardon from UNSC Oversight Chairman and Caron Industries CEO, Malcolm Hargrove. I can't imagine you like publicizing that second bit very much though. Probably not very good for business. Am I right, Chairman? On the contrary, you'd be surprised as to what can come of a merger between politics and corporations. If you're here to negotiate a surrender, I'm afraid I must inform you that your ship has set sail. Quite literally, in fact. Actually, we were just hoping to read you a letter. It's just a little something we put together for you. Considering we'll probably be seeing a lot of each other over the next few weeks. Take it away, Church. Dear Chairman, It has come to our attention that you have declared war on the planet Chorus. We regret to inform you that this is a really shitty idea. Not only have you managed to annoy the people that you failed to kill time and time again, you've also found a way to piss off an entire planet. Now, they may not have the best equipment, and they might not be the best fighters, but as you're aware, they've been fighting for a very long time. And now that they're not fighting each other, they're more than happy to dedicate all of their time to fighting you. So, dear chairman, to you and your idiotic mercenaries, we would like to say, bring it on, motherfuckers. We are not going anywhere. From your friends, the incredibly badass and sexually attractive, red and blue soldiers of Project Freelancer. P.S. Suck our balls. As Hargrove is left with the realization that our cast is a problem that won't be going away so easily, he speaks with Phyllis. She's incredibly demoralized by the death of the director and is left reluctantly obeying her programming as Hargrove's personal assistant. Phyllis, could you verify that Locus's delivery was sent to the trophy room? The crate from the shipwreck was unloaded and delivered this morning, sir. Wonderful. I could use a bit of good news today. There's something incredibly satisfying to me about the series not so subtly calling out capitalism's contribution to military corruption. Hargrove was the head of the UNSC's oversight committee, created to reinforce the standards and safety protocols that the military demanded of its various projects. He was the one leading the investigation against Director Church for his abuse of the Alpha AI, but now we can see plainly that it was his corporate relationship with the UNSC and the loss of his company's property that led him to that position in the first place. The military only ever acts in self-interest, and corporations are good at funding that self-interest because they only care about profits. Even the state's biggest military contractors provide weapons and vehicles globally for other countries. There's no loyalty to allies, only profit margins. Karan has never cared about moral integrity. Any concern that Hargrove ever had for the state of the Alpha AI was a result of rules and the knowledge that it was his acquisitions from illegal dig sites that led to its torture. Karan only cares about pleasing investors, and Hargrove does not give a single damn about who he needs to step on to do so. 
The person preaching about upholding military protocol is the same person orchestrating a planet-wide genocide in order to steal the tech of another species. The Venn diagram overlap of imperialism and capitalism is almost a complete circle at this point. It's fascinating to me that in the years since this series first aired, Rooster Teeth was bought by Warner Brothers, a company that has a famously tight relationship with the United States military. Though the Civil War has come to an abrupt halt, there is still a great deal of work that needs to be done on both sides. The final installment in the Chorus trilogy opens as Felix and Locus gain access to a UNSC military prison transport and the prisoners on board. They've taken casualties now that the Feds and New Republic have banded together to take out the pirates that they hired. Prisoners who don't trust their promises of wealth beyond imagining are spaced out the airlock. Among those who remain is a familiar face. In the fallout of Project Freelancer, Counselor Price went on the run. After the death of the director, he was finally caught. Being no stranger to working with malicious actors, he sees offering up his services and intimate knowledge of Washington and Carolina as a chance to save his own skin. And he's not the only person on the ship with a history with the freelancers. Back in Armonia, the Rebels and the Feds are still learning how to work together. Years of war haven't been making it easy, but the Reds and Blues have been put in charge of training, while Kimball and Doyle are struggling to reach an accord. Fortunately, Griff's inanity gives them something to agree on, and they're able to refocus on more important matters. Their men have just radioed in after the most recent assault on the pirates' bases. Caroline is just so damn fond of these guys, like you can hear the smile in her voice now. It makes me so soft to see her get into a point where she's comfortable showing her affection for them. Sergeant Tucker leaves to see the rest of their team while she and Epsilon hypothesize about what it was that Karan was after here. They're a bit perplexed to find out that the locals are just used to the alien temples and haven't actually questioned them. Church can't stop thinking that there's something more going on with them and he wants to find out what it is. The two find Dr. Gray and have her take a look through Karn's research while they go to integrate some recovered freelancer tech into Carolina's armor. It doesn't take Dr. Gray long before she finds out that Karn was trying to find a way to bring the temples out of dormancy. She wants to head out to the nearest one and see what they can find from some fieldwork. Tucker and Sarge volunteer to go with her, but a four-man team is ideal. You wouldn't happen to know of anyone else you could spare to help us, would you? Oh, I can think of someone. Please don't. Beatrice! <laughs> I fucking love Caboose, oh my god. <laughs> uh. Dr. Gray doesn't think that any of them will be especially helpful in the research part of investigating the temple, and gives them the job of running patrol to make sure that Karn's forces don't return. Sarge and Caboose are keeping an eye on the old base while Tucker is getting restless and wants to be present for the action. But while he's fucking around, he draws his sword. Remember how it's actually a key? Turns out it wasn't a key for just that one temple, but it could potentially activate others throughout the galaxy. When he accidentally slashes through the hologram, the temple produces a bounty of weapons and vehicles. But not only that, all of the hybrid alien tech from the Mercs suddenly activates or explodes. The AI guarding the temple attempts to speak with the sword bearer, in this case Tucker, and... Say something! Uh... What's up? Fortunately, the Chorus locals weren't the only ones affected by the temple's activation. Hargrove calls Felix and Locus to yell at them about the hybrid tech that he's brought into an investor meeting blowing up. In this scene, we can see that his chamber has become a trophy room filled with relics from Project Freelancer. The centerpiece of this mausoleum-like collection is a familiar set of armor, recovered from Agent Maine after his death, and since augmented with Karn's prototype tech. The Epsilon fragment is too old and too weak to power it, but Karn is working on acquiring a new AI. Hargrove believes that what his mercenaries need is a new source of motivation. So if they can complete their mission, 
he's willing to loan them the armor as part of the trial development. If they don't, then someone else will be given the chance to see how well it can tie up loose ends. Back on Chorus, Dr. Grace called in her leaders to report on their discoveries. Tucker's Keyblade nearly unlocked the temple, and the AI gave them a map marked with a set of coordinates. With Karn's mercenaries without access to their advanced tech, the two sides are finally on even ground. Kimball wants to make a push on the tractor beams at Site Alpha while the mercs are weakened, and is getting frustrated that the others don't feel the same sense of urgency. The away team wants to check out the map's coordinates. If they can activate the temple for the cache of weapons, then that's another resource that they can use to fight the mercs. Kimball wants all hands for an assault, but Doyle suggests that they divide and conquer. Carolina is allowed to take a team out, while Kimball leads the charge. Because he's still not a fan of dangerous situations, Doyle stays behind with some of their men to safeguard Armonia. Despite it being her idea, Kimball does have some concerns about the Federal Army soldiers following her commands. Washington assures her that they'll follow her. He's been training them, and everyone recognizes what's at stake. It'll take time for all of them to fully trust each other, but it's not impossible. Carolina's team is on their way to investigate the temple the map's taken them to, and we get to see how healthy her relationship with Epsilon is now. When they take a quick stop, we see that she's anxious about her ability to run her equipment and is trying to maximize efficiency. Epsilon talks her down from her obsessive thought pattern by reminding her that, historically, she's gotten hurt when she pushed herself too far. He cares about her, and he doesn't want her to risk another injury, so she should try to relax. Listen up. Right. Hey, are you doing okay? Okay, we're ready to go. Oh, badass, cool. Did you fill up our car too? Yeah, I gave it to both of them. Bow, bow chicka, chicka, bow. What? That's the joke, right? Did she just say my thing? Um, no, uh, Tucker, that hey, chicka, bump, bump. Awkward. You said to loosen up. It's a little too loose. Just tighten that back up a little bit. Karn's mercenaries are already a step ahead of them, reaching the temple thanks to the map appearing at all of the planet's temples. In the center of this one is a beam of energy that's similar to the teleporter grenades. Felix, being a fucking asshole, throws one of their men into the beam. He returns scared, having been confronted with his greatest fears, but physically he's unharmed. The temple told him that only a true warrior may enter. Felix automatically assumes that he fits the bill, but Locus believes that his commitment to being a soldier would allow him entry as well. They go in together, and it's here that we start to get a deeper understanding of Locus's ideology. The temple shows him a vision of his past as a soldier in the UNSC when his squad came upon an alien life form. Only now, Locus has taken the position of the monster at the end of his own gun. Their commanding officer is talked into executing the alien by Felix, and he snaps at Locus when he expresses a desire to treat the situation with more compassion and understanding. That's absurd. It's scared. If it's smart, it should be. If we can restrain it, we can... Son, you listen here! No. You are a soldier! In this war, you are nothing but a suit of armor and a gun, so when I give you an order, you damn well follow it! Do I make myself clear? No! Drop him! Drop him! Locus taking his codename from the type of armor that he wears makes more sense now with this interaction. He was forced to kill a scared, innocent being, and everyone but him believed that it was the right thing to do. His belief that being a true soldier means following orders without question was drilled into him, and it altered his critical thinking. Returning to the concept of self-continuity that I've brought up before, Locus now sees a part of himself that he denied for years. It contradicts everything that he's committed himself to since, his sense of self has been shaken, and he returns to the temple in a panic. Felix is tight-lipped about his own experience and brushes it off. He's no more a true warrior than Locus is, according to the temple's rules. The mercs fall back to their plan B. Felix snaps at them to pack up and get moving, and they're gone by the time that Carolina's team arrives. Dr. Gray translates the same message as before, that only a true warrior of physical strength and mental clarity may enter. Tucker is the first to jump in, assuming that having the sword should be enough to prove himself. He's spat out pretty quickly, and not particularly shaken up, though his trial did see him facing an onslaught of Locus's and Felix's. Carolina hears this and is very eager to prove herself in a rematch, so she and Epsilon head in together. When she passes through the shield, initially she's alone, but then she sees some old faces. Tex? Hey there, Carolina. I don't want to talk about it. Whatever happened in there, she's not talking about it right now. Her bad temper briefly comes back, and unfortunately for Caboose, he fails to be helpful. Until Epsilon recalls the temple's requirements for mental clarity. 
and Caboose is the most no-thoughts, head-empty person on the planet. Because he's generally fearless and absurdly strong, the AI determines that Caboose must be a true warrior. He returns with the AI, and they're given information about the other temples on this planet. There are several with various functions, but the one that they're most focused on is the Temple of Communication, which would allow them to bypass the radio jammers and broadcast a message across the galaxy. But there's another that would act as a self-destruct button for the planet, purging all sentient life as a failsafe if activated. Tucker's sword, though not from this planet, is able to unlock these towers, and it's bound to him until he dies. This planet's sword has yet to be claimed, however. The AI updates the temple maps with the locations of their new targets. All of the temples, which means the mercs have that location too. They get jumped by a team led by that same soldier from the prison ship. His identity isn't immediately obvious, and I kinda love that. This man calls himself Sharkface, and viewers who've been paying close attention might recognize him as one of the soldiers that Caroline's freelancers fought during their heist for the sarcophagus. See, those super soldier freaks dropped a building on me. They left me for dead, and then they killed my friends. They took away the only family I ever had while I was in physical fucking therapy. There is plenty of need for hostility here, Counselor. Then perhaps you should do your best to channel that energy. He has a vendetta against the people who hurt him and his family, and now he has Caroline exactly where he wants her. Her bubble shield is keeping them safe for now, but it's only a matter of time before it falls, and Caron is already sending forces to the radio jammer. Ow, fuck me. Sharkface radios Felix and Locus about the Purge Temple and the key. Felix leaves to catch up with him while Locus stays behind to continue fighting. Kimball radios Doyle for him to send reinforcements. Their people are struggling against the ambush, but Carolina calls in too. If they don't get a team to the Keyblade Temple, then Karin will have access to the Purge. Doyle sends a team to the temple, and fortunately, they get there before the mercs. It has already been claimed by another. No. God damn it! Oh, oh Lord. Of all the people on this planet, why am I the only one down here with this bloody thing? Thanks to Dr. Gray's modifications on Freckles, Carolina's team is able to take out Karn's forces and make their way to the temple. Back at the Jammers, the Reds in Washington are in charge of orchestrating the army's retreat. Simmons thinks that he can use one of the busted pelicans to create a smokescreen that will give them ample cover. Wash uses himself as bait to draw out Locus, using his obsession with him to give the soldiers a shot at taking him out. Simmons' distraction works beautifully, and as they're getting away, Wash broadcasts a message to Locus. There might be similarities between them, but Wash is the soldier, and Locus is just a killer. The team at the Keyblade Temple have run into some problems. The first is that Doyle is trying to hide from Felix, which means getting his position isn't an easy task. The second is that Sharkface is standing in their way. Carolina sees him as a challenge to be overcome, and Sharkface is more than happy to indulge in her flaws. She runs after him, leaving the rest of the Blues to hide from the Mercs while they look for Doyle. Instead, they find Doc in a cave, where he ended up after being trapped in a pocket dimension for an indeterminate amount of time thanks to that teleporter grenade. Man, I guess we just never noticed you were gone. Crazy, huh? <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> you incompetent fools. You will all taste oblivion. <laughs> it's, uh... It's pretty clear that the events of this, and the Reds and Blues failing to recognize his disappearance, has had some adverse effects on him, and whatever Omega did to his head way back when has been greatly exacerbated. But he's back! And Donut and Lopez are here too now! Dr. Gray stays behind with the now unconscious Doc while the rest of them go to find Doyle. They catch up with him just as Felix has him cornered. Doyle panics and throws the sword off the cliff so he can get away. After a brief standoff, Felix gets away too, thanks to Locus. It's obvious that the mercs have no idea how the swords work though, because if they did, Doyle would probably be dead. Back with Carolina and Epsilon, we get a fight scene, and I actually love this one a lot. The choreography might not be the most elaborate compared to Monty's work, but the camera is actually dynamic and they utilize the environment really well. Zipping through these ice caves and crashing into each other, and this chaos is a perfect reflection of Carolina's mental state. Ever since the temple, her headspace has worsened, and her tendency to push herself and Epsilon returns tenfold. 
Church had already been struggling to run all of her equipment that she's picked up, and it's draining him more than his system can handle. But she's so focused on proving herself that she refuses to take the safe option of retreating and forces them both to continue the fight. But Epsilon can't handle the pressure, so he cracks. Delta? It's too much! What do we do? I don't know. In a mirror to her final day with Project Freelancer, Carolina falls and she gets hurt. And this time, it's her own fault. It's not an end, fortunately. They all make it back to Harmonia intact, though a bit bruised. Kimball isn't happy that Doyle allowed the key to fall into the enemy's hands and resents the idea that now they have to spend resources on protecting him. Washington once again tries to mediate, but Kimball is too pissed off. She doesn't want to give Kara the chance to corner them again, and she believes that Doyle should have thrown the sword off the cliff and taken the bullet. There is clearly a part of her projecting her own eagerness to sacrifice her life for the cause onto the situation, and the lack of respect isn't helping. She walks away with the last word, and then Doyle walks away as well. Washington's getting concerned. They need to get these two sides to fully cooperate with each other and recognize that they're all fighting for the same thing. If they can't do that, then Karan has already won. After recovering from her fall at Omonio's hospital, Carolina confronts Epsilon about what happened. She's mad at him for failing her, and he finally has to establish a need for boundaries. He's not failing like Sharkface implied, but he is old, and trying to run so much of her equipment at once is too much for him to handle, especially because he's just a fragment. This is really hard for her to respect. Carolina is scared and reckless because her trial at the temple re-traumatized her. The truth finally comes out as she tells Church that she was forced to see the people that she cared about die, and she couldn't do anything to stop it. She needs the validation that she's strong enough to protect the people that she loves. After everything that she's been through, Carolina finally has a family again with the Reds and Blues, and she is terrified of losing them. Doyle finds them at the tail end of their conversation and offers his sympathy and some vulnerability. He is afraid too. He was never meant to be a leader, and he feels as though he's failing the people that he's been charged to protect. You know, I believe it was the great William Shakespeare who said, Courage is not the absence of fear. It is acting in spite of it. I don't believe those words have ever been more relevant. I don't think that was Shakespeare. What? That quote. I don't think he said that. Really? Yeah, pretty sure. Uh, yeah. Oh. Still, it's a good quote. Thank you. Hmm. Help. Here's to hoping the mercs are just as frustrated as the rest of us. I am extremely frustrated! Back with the mercs, Felix is pissed off at Sharkface for neglecting to inform them that they needed to kill Doyle in order to get the key to function properly. Locus intervenes before they can stop fighting, but despite having a new goal and the means to attain it, it's clear that this partnership is fracturing. Felix and Sharkface leave him as he calls Counselor Price. He wants to know more about the meta and Agent Maine. Price explains that the Sim Troopers were able to accomplish what the Freelancers never could. They defeated May not because of their skills or their gear, but because they had unwavering faith in each other. The scheming of the project had created irreparable rifts in the relationships between their agents, and it was the Reds and Blues' resiliency and their trust in each other that allowed them to work together to defeat Maine. Price admits that had they faced Maine before the loss of his AI fragments, the outcome may have been different. What you say, Maine performed at his best when controlled by Sigma. With the meta strove to be the perfect weapon. You're mistaken in assuming Sigma's definition of perfection. The meta never wanted to be a weapon. The meta wanted to be human. Locus is coming to realize that his ideology and his definition of a soldier is flawed. Maine wasn't an ideal soldier because he followed orders blindly, but because he believed in fighting for the greater good, even if that idea of goodness came from questionable leadership. Locus's current beliefs stand in opposition to this. The Meta strove to be human, and Maine, prior to Sigma's corruption, was a compassionate protector. Locus's devotion to orders above all takes away his own agency and thus dehumanizes him. 
So if he isn't a soldier, and if he isn't truly human, then what is he? It's a question that he has to answer for himself, and I really appreciate how this ties into the series' anti-war messaging and the overall theme of identity. So many characters are forced to reckon with their relationship to the world around them, and the type of person that they want to become. Who are you after you've been stripped of your agency? What steps do you need to take in order to take it back? These are questions that I find really resonant, and I love that the series brings them up like this. Locus, however, is left with this internal debate as we continue, and his isn't the only personal conflict that still needs resolution. Back in Harmonia, Doc has been recruited to help the Feds and Rebels find common ground so they can start working together. This poor man is so excited to finally be included, but getting Kimball and Doyle to see eye to eye is a tall order after everything that both sides have been through. Kimball still refuses to respect Doyle's ability as a leader, and he's too risk-averse to allow her to spend men and resources on fighting back. He calls her out for being too self-sacrificial, but he admits that he admires her. I can honestly say that I've never met a more courageous individual in all my life. What? 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 I mean, all right, great job! I wish... I wish I had a tenth of the courage that you possess. Maybe if I did, I'd have made a better general. But I don't. And I'm afraid. Not just for myself, but for my people. They're my people too. Which is precisely why we should be working to save them. You think some cheap compliments are going to win me over? Why do you insist on fighting me? Kimball's lack of trust makes her incapable of accepting the compliment but they've got bigger concerns right now. The Mercs have begun assaulting the city. Up until this point, the fusion reactor at the heart of Armonia has kept them safe. The alien tech and supplies that the Mercs were forced to leave behind would be destroyed if they were to bomb the city. Of course, his people might be dead if they did, but they'd lose everything that they've been fighting to attain. It's the only upper hand that they've had since calling their ceasefire and forcing Karn's Mercs out. But the Mercs need Doyle dead, and they don't care how many men they lose. So they prepare for ground war. Epsilon has an idea of how to turn the tide in their favor. Use Tucker and Doyle as bait while the armies evacuate everyone that they can. Abandon the city and set the reactor to blow. They'll lose Armonia, but they'll take out the mercs and the tech they came for in one fell swoop. It's not a great plan, but it is the one they have. Kimball, Carolina, and Wash are in charge of the reactor meltdown. Doyle and the Reds and Blues are in charge of gathering all the supplies that they can but their pelican needs repairs. The team gets jumped by mercs while they're waiting to get it up and running. They fight them off, but now their cover is blown. If the mercs see Tucker and Doyle getting in the ship and leaving, then they won't have a reason to stay in the city. The whole plan will be meaningless, so Doyle leaves to lure away the mercs and catch up with Kimball. Sharkface reaches them first, but Carolina is the one that he wants. She tells Kimball and Wash to get moving, and she faces off with him. But they don't fight immediately. Instead, she does this. I'm sorry for what we did to you, to your friends. You were on one side of the fight and we were on the other. We thought we were the good guys. I'm sorry. I don't care if you're sorry. Sorry doesn't change what you did. Sorry doesn't bring them back. I know, but I'm offering you a choice. I don't want to fight you. I think that it's really important for Carolina's overarching personal narrative that she offers him a chance to choose forgiveness. She knows all too well what it's like to spend a life seeking revenge, and she came close to losing herself the last time that they fought. So she gives him a choice. But he's too blinded by rage to recognize the genuinity of her words, so they fight. Even with their minor flaws, all of the fight scenes in this season are top tier. There's such creativity in the choices of combat settings, and the camera movements really make this one special, using the close quarters nature of a speeding monorail to make the fight intimate and enhance the intensity. The track that underscores the fight as well is really good, and has such a tense beat that emphasizes just how fast they're going. I love it so damn much. With Carolina occupied by Sharkface, Washington and Kimball are getting lost in the maze of the city's service tunnels. Doyle recognizes the urgency of the situation and takes over the role of accessing the reactor controls. He knows the city inside and out, and he can reach them before they do. They'll only have about 15 minutes once he activates the meltdown. 
Kimball and Wash head to the rendezvous, catching up with Carolina along the way in order to wait his return. Unfortunately, the mercs tracked him down. The controls are blown, so he makes the only decision that they have left. He'll have to blow the reactor core himself. He'll die, but the rest of them will make it to safety, and it's a sacrifice that only he can make now. For God's sake, Vanessa, I know it's not perfect, but I'm rubbish as a leader, and even worse, as a soldier. This is all I can do. We have to go. We'll finally have a chance, a real chance, and if Felix is out there, I know you can stop him. There he is! They've spotted me. The timer on the detonator barely lasts a minute. You need to go. God damn it, Doyle! Stop! Cora still needs you, Miss Kimball. So, when you die, you had better be better sure that those you leave behind can carry on without you. I know I am. This is General Donald Doyle. Signing off. Wait, no! The rest of them get to the pelican, but it's not moving fast enough. And in what I see as the pinnacle of Carolina's personal arc, she protects her family by getting on top of the pelican to deploy her bubble shield. This is her finally proving her worth to herself. By calling back to the member of her old team who held the most compassion and drive towards protection, Carolina effectively reinvents herself and ceases to be just a weapon. She's no longer a warrior of death, as her old light motif once implied. Now she's a guardian. I really appreciate that after everything that she's been through, Carolina has finally found who she is. She spent years fighting to be someone that others expected of her, acting as a tool for Project Freelancer, and it cost her everything. Her true need as a character was to be loved and to have people that she could love in return. A family. It might not have been what she was expecting when she first met them, and given her early treatment of them, it would have been totally valid for the Reds and Blues to have rejected her. But they didn't. None of them are perfect people. Hell, the series started with the Reds and Blues at war with each other, but I really appreciate that they've all been given the space and grace to grow as people. The show recognizes that people can fuck up, but in spite of that, their lives still have worth. No one is obligated to forgive someone who's wronged them in the past but it is wrong to believe that they can't change for the better if they show they're willing to put in the work to do so. Carolina has done some shitty things in the past, but she's learned how to forgive, and she's learned how to be a better person through the relationships that she's made ever since. Doyle's sacrifice worked. Karin's forces have now suffered a major blow, but morale is still low. They've all made it safely to crash site Bravo, but Felix and Locus got out as well. And with Doyle dead, Felix has access to the sword and the temples. The AI isn't thrilled to have to be working for Felix, and though reluctant to make preparations for the purge, it complies. The two head to the purge temple to activate it, while the rest of their forces are relegated to defending the comm tower. Locus expresses his concern over this. Their men at the tower will likely be killed, and some of them are former partners. His change of heart prompts Felix to remind him that they have their orders. And this gives him pause. Locus is slowly coming to grips with his altered sense of self, but he's not quite there yet. When Felix leaves to speak with Hargrove, he turns to the AI. You guard these relics. You spoke to me in the gateway. Created the things I saw. Correct. Then can you tell me? What did Felix see? What is it he's afraid of? Is it not so obvious? With time running out, the Reds and Blues make their plan. They know where Felix and Locus are headed, so Carolina and Wash will intercept them at the Purge Temple, while the rest of the team heads to the comm tower to try and send their message. The biggest problem now is that there's still discord among the armies. The Federation soldiers believe that Kimball let Doyle die on purpose, and the team hasn't succeeded in convincing them otherwise. So Kimball goes to talk to them. Excuse me. If I could have your attention, please. Hey! Turn it up. It's Kimball. The 
fuck does she want? I know many of you probably don't care for what I have to say, but it's something that needs to be said. Think she can do this? Hell yeah, Kimball's a great speaker. I never believed this truce would last. What? What? Oh god, we're screwed. I thought that if we managed to survive Karon, it would only be a matter of time before we were back at each other's throats. I believe this, because in my eyes, the Federal Army of Chorus was still the enemy. When you spend every day fighting a war, you learn to demonize your attackers. To you, they're evil, they're... they're subhuman. Because if they weren't, then what would that make you? What I'm trying to say is I've been afraid to see you for what you really are. You're our brothers, our sisters, and the things we've done to one another are unforgivable. But General Doyle was able to see past that. In the end, he understood that now isn't the time for pride or anger, now is the time for unity. Every day I ask myself, what do you fight for? And every day I answer, for a better tomorrow. Well, if we can't set aside our past and start trusting one another, there won't be a tomorrow. So please, fight with me. Fight to see Malcolm Hargrove locked away for the rest of his life. Fight to wipe that stupid grin off of Felix's face. Fight because you deserve to fucking win! Well, shit. I'll fight for that. <laughs>With renewed drive, the soldiers finally have the confidence that they need to fight together. Using Tucker's sword, they're able to access the alien armory, and with their new tech, they go to war. Felix and Locust stand off against Wash and Carolina, and this is one of my favorite fights in the entire show. The music is just so good, and I love the character moments that happen throughout it, cutting back and forth between the action on these platforms and a Price's mutiny aboard the Tartarus, and I love their little mannerisms. Locust is physically aggressive in a way that's different from Felix, who's far more aggressive now that he has the sword. I particularly love this small moment when Carolina puts her hand on Wash's back to make sure that he's ducked under the incoming platform. And then the finale to the fight is so satisfying. They've used Felix's arrogance against him yet again to waste time until the squad that they sent out reaches the tractor beam. Carolina and Epsilon shield wash under the bubble shield while the prison ship is forced to crash into the tower. Taking it out of play like this is so damn satisfying. When the dust settles, all that's left is to get to the comm tower. The armies have been tearing through Karon's mercenaries, but there's a mantis droid on the battlefield that's pushing them back. Wash and Carolina stay behind to deal with it, while Epsilon hops into Tucker's armor, and joins him and the rest of the Reds and Blues going up the comm tower. The AI greets them and gets preparations in order for them. Though it won't take long, they soon find themselves a bit preoccupied. Uh, who's that? I thought you said they were dead! We dropped the fucking spaceship on them! It was kind of assumed! Scatter! <laughs> Felix crashes their ship into the tower. Locust was hurt far worse than he was in the explosion, and is weakened as he moves through the tower. The AI finds him. secure your victory over their forces? No. Then what purpose will it serve? I don't know. Then why are you trying? I don't know. 
What do you know? I don't know. Then what do you want to know? I... I want to know what Felix is afraid of. You were broken by war. It was his goal to see that you never healed. Because despite what he may claim, only one of you needs the other to survive. What are you saying? Ignorant creature. Your partner is afraid of you. Ever since they were in the military together, Felix has been using Locus for his own purposes, manipulating his ideology to serve him. And now that Locus sees that, he has a choice. He doesn't have to keep doing this anymore. Felix finds the reds and blues, but he's hurt and they have him surrounded now, and he no longer has Locus to protect him. They've both made their choices, and Felix's costs him his life. Locus picks up the sword that he left behind and activates the tower for our team. His choice now is to try and atone for what he's done, and then he leaves. It'll take a lot for him to make things right, but he wouldn't be the first. If I ever see another mercenary, it'll be too soon. Amen. How about we send that message? Sounds good to me. You ready? Epsilon manages to send out their message, broadcasting through the entire galaxy their situation of Hargrove's crimes. We watch as secondary characters that we've met throughout the series listen to their plea for help, and watch Hargrove as he realizes that everything that he's done is about to destroy him. Chorus's army rejoices at the victory, and they're already detecting a ship on its way to the planet. But it's not the victory that they were hoping for. You have made a terrible mistake. Hargrove drops more droids onto the planet and begins decimating what remains of Chorus's defenders. Epsilon believes that they'll be able to shut down the droids, but they have to get to the controls, and that means boarding the Staff of Karan. They use the busted pelican that the mercs left behind to get onto the ship. Epsilon easily convinces Phyllis to help them out. She's been looking for an excuse to turn on her current handler. She opens corridors for them and access to the override controls. Tucker and Epsilon get inside while the others hold off Karan's forces. And with a final word to Hargrove, it's done. Chorus is saved. But they're still in danger. Karan's soldiers aren't going down without a fight, and a rescue team might not make it in time. So they make their final stand. Everyone gets into position and takes weapons from Hargrove's collection to defend themselves. And as a final measure, Tucker dons Agent Main's armor. A new version of Contact plays as they get ready for the breach, piano and strings as Epsilon gets ready for the end, because this time, this time is different. Time comes to a standstill as we focus in on Epsilon's point of view, and he leaves them with his final message. I'm sure. Start a recording for me, D. Recording? Hey guys. If you're hearing this, it means you did it. You won. You kicked the shit out of Hargrove's forces. I knew you could. But this is my last stop. See, when I came into this world, I was really just a collection of somebody else's memories. But with your help, these memories, they, they took form. They became my voice, my personality. And after a while, I, I began to make brand new memories of my own. All of these things are what make me who I am. But they're also holding me back. I can't run this suit as Epsilon. But if I erase my memories, if I deconstruct myself, the fragments I'll leave behind will have the strength to get you through this. I believe that. 
I wish there was another way. But I'm leaving this message, as well as others, in the hopes that you'll understand why I have to go this time. <laughs> it was... it was actually Doyle who made me realize something I never thought of before. There's so many stories where some brave hero decides to give their life to save the day. And because of their sacrifice, the good guys win, the survivors all cheer, and everybody lives happily ever after. But the hero never gets to see that ending. They'll never know if their sacrifice actually made a difference. They'll never know if the day was really saved. In the end, they just have to have faith. Ain't that a bitch. With this final sacrifice, we see the ultimate conclusion of Leonard Church's story. From the director to Alpha to Epsilon, each has an arc that is completely saturated in themes of heroism and sacrifice, alongside the series' ideas of identity. Everything that the director did with Project Freelancer was driven by the guilt that he wasn't the one sacrificed for the war that he believed in. He was haunted by the grief that he had for his wife, and instead of sacrificing his life in the heat of battle, what he sacrificed instead was the potential to love. He gave up a real relationship with his daughter to chase ideas of greatness, and when Allison came back as Agent Texas, he gave even more of himself away, sacrificing his own morality. He tortured Alpha, tore himself to pieces in a way, and in the end, he lost everything chasing the memory of a real hero. When Alpha sacrificed himself to stop the meta, it wasn't necessarily altruistic. Given his disbelief in Wash, he might have seriously believed that he would come back again, but because of his actions, he did ultimately aid in his friend's getaway. Alpha was an asshole who never wanted nor intended to be a hero, almost a refusal of the person that he once was. But he still did it. Epsilon was the version who was finally given a chance to grow beyond who he was, and in a way, he fulfilled the director's ultimate desires, all while staying true to who he'd become. Epsilon was able to form friendships, and he made a family out of the other Sim Troopers and found a sister in Carolina. Their connection finally showed Carolina what a supportive familial relationship could be like, and he fostered her growth, and he grew alongside her. He made mistakes, and he pushed people away with his anger, but he was able to become better than who he was before, and it was because of this capacity for growth that he finally became what the meta had always been chasing after. Epsilon through the power of memory and connection, was as close to human as he could have possibly gotten. And in the end, like the versions of himself that came before, Church sacrificed himself. And he sacrificed himself for a cause that he truly believed in, for the people that he loved, even if he might never say those words himself. An inherently human concept is that of faith. Across the world, across cultures, we are burdened with the necessity of believing in things that we cannot find tangible, be it a deity or having faith in oneself to uphold your moral values. If there is anything that separates us, anything that makes us something more, it's that. We are not machines. We are not driven by logic, but emotion. And at the end of all things, Epsilon had to have faith. He had to believe that his sacrifice meant something, even if he would never see the outcome. And it's with his death that I find a fitting end to the story and it's come to mean so much to me. When I first watched this series, I was alone with my thoughts for the first time since I'd moved out of my emotionally negligent mother's house and in with my father. I'd left her house after I graduated from high school, but I'd immediately thrown myself into an underpaid internship across the state and then a seasonal retail job when I got home. And when that job ended, I was suddenly stuck at home with nothing to distract me. Just me and my cats while my dad went to work. And then I found this colorful puppet show, and I was able to laugh and cry. And looking back, I think that this was the start of my mask finally starting to slip away. Getting to see this cast of characters who had struggled against a system that didn't care about them as they triumphed, despite all of the odds and their perceived inadequacies. Watching as Carolina left behind the pain of her past and resolved to become someone that she could be proud of. 
seeing Washington break free of the expectations that were placed upon him and allow himself to embrace his compassion to become a healthier individual, it took me a few years to finally get to a state that I'd actually consider healthy, and it's something I'm still actively working on every day. But this series was so formative for me in that journey to recognize my trauma and start to heal from it. And Epsilon's sacrifice has taught me a lot about grieving, something I didn't realize I'd need until I lost someone close to me. At the end of the day, memory is the key. It's how and what we choose to remember about our own lives and those whom we've lost that determines who we are. And it's not always easy, but we can always try. This is obviously not the end of Red vs. Blue, not by a long shot, and I'm going to go ahead and say that I have a lot of feelings about the seasons that follow, but for me, for now, I think this is where we can close the book. I'd like to say a few words from the great William Shakespeare, and yes, these actually are his this time. When to the sessions of sweet, silent thought, I summon up remembrance of things past. I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought, and with old woes new wail my dear time's waste, then I can drown an eye, unused to flow. For precious friends hid in death's stateless night, and weep afresh love's long since cancelled woe, and moan the expense of many a vanished sight, then can I grieve at grievances foregone, and heavily from woe to woe tell o'er the sad account of forbemoaned moan, which I knew pay as if not paid before. But if the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored, and sorrows end.